The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled Promoting Stability, Reviewing the Administration's Deregulatory Approach to Financial Stability. I want to inform all concerns that this meeting will end at 1 p.m. per the request of the secretary. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. So let me welcome back Secretary Mnuchin. Today, we're here to discuss the Trump administration's actions that have undermined and not promoted our nation's financial stability. As I have said many times before, I'm very concerned about this administration's actions to eliminate important protections for consumers, investors, and our economy. It appears that our banking regulators are following the deregulatory blueprint that the Treasury Department, under Secretary Mnuchin's leadership, has mapped out point by point and rolling back many of the critical reforms Democrats made to prevent another financial crisis. If these rollbacks continue, there will be grave consequences for financial stability and our economy. The 2008 financial crisis was devastating for our nation. 11 million Americans lost their homes, 13 trillion in wealth was lost, and nearly 9 million Americans lost their jobs. As chairwoman of this committee, I'm committed to doing everything that I can to ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past, as I've now seen twice how the road of deregulation leads to financial crisis. The focus of this hearing is the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC. We created FSOC as part of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act to eliminate regulatory gaps and to ensure the government could identify and mitigate risk to our economy. After the financial crisis, FSOC designated several large non-bank financial companies for enhanced oversight, including AIG, the well-known poster child for the financial crisis. Under the Trump administration, however, FSOC ceased supervision of all of these non-banks and advanced an activities-based approach that amounts to more deregulation, willfully ignoring how catastrophic the failure of a large financial institution would be for the financial system and economy. The Trump administration also cut FSOC's budget and reduced its staff by half. It has also reduced the budget and staff of the Office of Financial Research, that is OFR, which collects data and conducts research and analysis to aid FSOC in its important work. Along the way, the Trump administration has fleeced the American taxpayers with their tax scam, which contain more big giveaways to the nation's largest banks. All of these steps put Wall Street's bottom line first and Main Street back at risk. And make no mistake, the risks are growing. Climate change, cybersecurity, leverage lending, hedge funds, and the rapid emergence of big tech in the financial system led by Facebook are all concerns that must be taken seriously. Today, Secretary Mnuchin will also once again be asked to explain the harmful actions of the Trump administration to the American public. With that, I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Secretary Mnuchin, thank you for being here in your capacity as uh, chair of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Um, and I uh, appreciate the work you're doing uh, in leading the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Um, I do also think that this, the timing of this hearing would have been uh, more favorable if members had, given, had been given more time to uh, read your report that was released yesterday. Um, but that's a timing issue here um, that we have to contend with. So my colleagues on both sides of the aisle haven't had ample time to review uh, the important work uh, that the council is, has in this report. Um, and so uh, I think instead of just uh, 
the, the political debate about uh, regulatory changes that the administration has done. I think this oversight uh, of, the, uh, of the Financial Stability Oversight Council is really important. The issue of stability, financial stability, and security are really important. Yesterday, prudential regulators testified before this committee on similar issues. Um, during that hearing, I stated my concern with the transition from uh, the reliance on LIBOR, or the London Inter, uh, Interbank Over Offering Rate, or uh, to SOFR, uh, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate. Um, I think uh, the issues that we have uh, and concerns we have there are about uh, financial stability. Um, and there, it's also magnified by recent Fed actions in the repo market um, and uh, that we can see more of at the end of the year. Um, I also encourage uh, Vice, Chair, uh, Vice Chairman Quarles to continue his review of the re regulatory regime to ensure that safety and soundness and, and, and promoting economic growth are prioritized um, in, uh, in, in their measures. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on the repo market as well. I think it's very important for us to hear uh, uh, from you on that. Um, and so, um, but back to this, this question about LIBOR to, to SOFOR. Um, LIBOR's underlying bank reference rate for about, about $200 trillion in financial contracts worldwide, and it's set to be phased out as a bank reference rate uh, by 2021 and replaced with SOFR. Given the recent volatility in the repo markets, I'm concerned about the subsequent volatility in mortgages, auto loans, business loans, and other consumer loans as a new reference rate is derived uh, from secured overnight financing. Uh, additionally, uh, transferring LIBOR-based legacy contracts to SOFOR will undoubtedly require financial institutions to renegotiate with customers. This is also an issue of financial stability and economic growth. Finally, Secretary Mnuchin, I wrote to you uh, last month regarding an issue that I believe is, uh, is an alarming issue of a potentially enormous consequence, and that's the financial transaction tax. This is not a honeypot of money that just uh, comes from heaven. Uh, this will be uh, a tax uh, based off of buying or selling stocks, bonds, or other financial instruments um, that many are talking about as a, as a new way to derive revenue for the federal government. Um, and, it, and the rhetoric is that it will hit only the wealthiest. The reality is that average everyday investors, uh, especially mu mutual fund investors, and those that are saving for retirement will be severely impacted uh, by this, um, this nefarious tax. And in, in fact, one study indicates that a typical mutual fund investor will have to save an additional $600 per year uh, uh, or work an additional two years to achieve the same retirement goals. I would like to hear from the Financial Stability, uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council and from OFR on this matter. I think it's important that our government have an analysis of what this would do to our markets and our investors. Look forward to your testimony and thank you for being here before the committee. I now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, Mr. Meeks, for one minute. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Mr. Secretary, welcome. I will repeat to you what I stated to Governor Brainard and OFR Director Falacetti when they testified at a hearing I chaired in September on financial stability. I was serving on this committee at the depths of the financial crises, and I never ever want to be put in a position again where the Treasury Secretary comes to the floor of the House and tells us, literally, we have days to save the U.S. economy from total collapse. I never again want to engage with constituents who are losing their homes and their life savings for no fault of their own. But because the regulators and administration had completely lost track of systemic risk in the economy, mapping, Quantifying, containing, and building contingency plans for systemic risk is not and should not be a partisan issue and should not be a means for scoring political points. This matters to every American family that is saving retirement to put a child through school, and I hope that we can do this in an intellectually honesty manner devoid of political or partisan influence. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Lukemeyer, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Secretary Mnuchin. I really appreciate you being here to testify today. Uh, just yesterday, we had the prudential regulators before this uh, committee discussing a myriad of issues, from regulatory right-sizing to the Community Reinvestment Act to future pending regulations 
the financial services industry is facing a variety of issues right now, as you well know. As, we, as you are the head of FSOC, which serves as the body where regulators come together to discuss overall financial stability, I'm looking forward to discussing how FSOC is addressing the different matters affecting our financial system today. Major areas of concern <laughs> include CECL, cybersecurity, fintechs, repo market, and LIBOR. All these things will have a significant effect on both consumers and the economy and deserve the full attention of FSOC. I look forward to discussing these issues, and with that, I, discuss, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. At this time, I want to welcome to the committee our witness, Stephen T. Mnuchin, Secretary of the Treasury. He has served in his current position since 2017. Mr. Mnuchin has testified before the committee on previous occasions, and I believe he does not need any further introduction. Without objection, your written testimony will be made part of the record. Secretary Mnuchin, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you very much. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss the Financial Stability Oversight Council's 2019 Annual Report and other priorities of the Treasury Department. The report is the product of extensive collaboration among Council members, and I appreciate the hard work by the staffs of the Treasury Department and other member agencies. The report provides Congress and the public with the Council's analysis of financial and regulatory trends and its assessment of the potential risk to U.S. financial stability. It also provides recommendations to enhance the integrity, efficiency, competitiveness, and stability of the U.S. financial markets. Since the publication of the Council's last annual report in December 2018, the U.S. economy has continued to perform extremely well. Economic growth in the United States far exceeds our G7 trading partners, and unemployment rates are near a 50-year low, including unemployment levels at or near level lows for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and women. Wages are rising faster for hardworking families, corporate and consumer delinquency and default rates are low, and financial conditions remain stable. This year's annual report discusses a number of risks we continue to monitor, but I want to highlight cybersecurity as one of the most important issues for the council, regulators, and the private sector. Financial firms heavily rely on information technology, which creates great efficiencies for consumers and business, but also increases the risk that a serious cybersecurity incident could negatively affect the economy and potentially have implication for U.S. financial stability. We make specific recommendations in the report on this important topic. Among other things, government and industry should work together to constantly update and share best practices to ensure that we are treating cybersecurity as a vital national and economic security priority. The report also provides a strong message to market participants about the need to prepare for a transition away from LIBOR as a reference rate. Failure to prepare adequately could cause significant disruptions across financial markets and to borrowers given the widespread use of LIBOR. We recommend that market participants formulate and execute transition plans and that any new instruments that reference LIBOR should include fallback language to mitigate the risk in the event that LIBOR becomes unavailable. We also encourage financial regulators to evaluate the effects of new financial products on financial stability, including potential risks from digital assets and distributed ledger technologies. We will continue to use the Council's working group on these issues to promote consistent regulatory approaches to identify and address potential risks while promoting American leadership in financial services innovation. Turning to another of Treasury's key priorities, we will continue working with this committee on meaningful housing finance reform to foster competition for the benefit of consumers, protect taxpayers from future bailouts, and facilitate a smooth transition for the government-sponsored enterprises out of conservatorship. I am proud of the work we have done with President Trump's leadership to create a resilient, thriving, and prosperous economy. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Now that I have 
I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Secretary Mnuchin, I want to go straight to uh, a discussion about hedge fund. In November 2016, when the last public update on the hedge fund working group's progress was issued, the FSOC outlined five data limitations that needed to be addressed to better understand the risk posed by hedge funds. At times, in the lead-ups to past crises, activities and losses in the hedge fund sector have proven significant leading indicators. For example, Bear Stearns hedge funds with subprime exposure collapsed in the summer of 2007, signaling the impending subprime crisis. When was the last time the hedge fund group working group convened? Why has the working group not met more frequently during your tenure as FSOC's chair? What is the status of the limitations identified in FSOC's last public update? Does FSOC now have access to the data previously identified in 2016 so that it can assess whether hedge funds are a source of systemic risk to the economy? If not, why hasn't the FSOC taken any steps to address this information gap over the past three years? This is very important. We have members of this committee who are trying to make some decisions about hedge funds. We have members of this committee who think there's some who are operating in good faith, but there are many who are not. We're worried about hedge funds that take over fire departments and hospitals and other city services. We're worried about hedge funds that take over fire departments and the response time is slowed down. We're worried about hospitals closing down. So why don't you talk to us about what you know about what is happening, about the working group that was supposed to convene and help us to deal with this issue. Thank you very much. So let me first uh, highlight on page 94 of the report. Uh, we specifically talk about hedge funds. Uh, so this is something that the staff is monitoring. Um, since we've moved to an activities-based approach as opposed to an industry approach, we are monitoring all of the activities that hedge funds participate in as part of our risk management. And one of the areas in particular we focused on that I know the committee has highlighted is leveraged lending. Uh, I'd also would say that uh, fortunately the hedge fund industry has delevered significantly but uh, I appreciate your concerns and we will continue to monitor carefully all of the activities of hedge funds. Distinction for us between the hedge funds and the private equity funds. Are they involved in the same kinds of uh, operations and acquisitions? Uh, normally they're not, Madam Chair, and, and we do specifically also on page 94 break out private equity funds. The, the difference is that Mostly, and again, I'll give you, the majority of the hedge funds are in liquid markets, uh, and the majority of private equity funds are buying companies or illiquid assets. And because of that, typically the private equity funds are structured as very long-term funds, and the hedge funds are normally subject to annual liquidity, which does create additional risk that we are- Thank you for that clarification. When was the last time the hedge fund working group convened? I can check on that for you and get back to you, but as I suggested, we're, we've really focused on activities, so the activities are being monitored as opposed to specifically the hedge fund working group, but we'll get back to you on that. Well, do you know the status of the limitations identified in FSOC's last public update? Uh, yes, and, and again, as I've suggested, we specifically comment on hedge funds and private equity funds in the report, and that is something that the council is focused on. Does FSOC now have access to the data previously identified in 2016 so that it can assess uh, whether hedge funds are a source of systemic risk to the economy? Uh, so some of that data we do have access to and, and some of the data we've determined is, is no longer relevant. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from North Carolina, Ranking Member, Mr. McHenry, is recognized for five minutes. So, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, as you well know, and as, a, as your report, as the uh, FSOC report here uh, notes, and the, um, uh, 
Uh, in the past few months, we've seen significant volatility in the repo markets. Um, and I know this, uh, there's speculation about uh, what sort of combination of things occurred um, uh, that, that uh, created this volatility. Um, there's speculation that there's a combination of regulatory effects that are impacting monetary policy. Um, and uh, that there are regulatory and supervisory actions that are unduly disincentivizing banks who are required to hold cash, hold cash at the Fed, uh, from using their cash reserves when the repo market, when the market needs it um, and needs liquidity the most. And so uh, the Office of Financial Research is starting to collect data on repo transactions. That's, that's positive. And the council directed agencies to undertake a focused review. Uh, so uh, as the chair of FSOC, do you believe the spike in repo rates signals uh, a need to examine the overarching regulatory regime uh, for potential risks to financial stability? So let me first say we, we share your concern about uh, those two days when there was a significant spike. Uh, as recent as yesterday, we had the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is responsible for market operations, give a presentation to FSOC. Uh, I've met with Chairman Powell multiple times. We've talked about this as, as recent as this morning. Uh, we've discussed in our, in our weekly meeting making sure that the Fed is prepared for year-end activities so that there are ample reserves. I think it was a result of many different issues that came together in one day, one of them being, as you've outlined, certain regulatory issues. Banks required to have excess overdrafts for intraday. So this is not liquidity, normal liquidity, but this is intraday liquidity. There is also the impact of the Federal Reserve holds the Treasury cash account. We had a large payment of taxes, so effectively you had money coming out of banks going into the Treasury account, which drained reserves. But I can assure you this is something FSOC is very focused on, and this is something in my role of Treasury Secretary, uh, Chair Powell and I are working together on. Okay. So uh, along those lines, the impact of regulation can impact uh, uh, monetary policy. And in this circumstance, when you have federal regulation uh, demanding banks hold assets, and then they believe that they should not use those because of regulation, that becomes problematic. And so I think the, a, a systemic review of this to ensure that that interday activity uh, can, can be uh, dealt with adequately, I think, is really important. Um, the Wall Street Journal highlighted the question of tax payments, that there was a, a, a deadline and the, the timing of the deadline on tax payments uh, had an implication uh, for the market, as you just mentioned. Uh, on a going forward basis, is Treasury reviewing some of those timing issues? We, we are, and we're working very closely with the Federal Reserve, as I said, to make sure that there are ample reserves, both associated with the Treasury cash accounts, and we are working with the bank regulators on what could have been regulatory issues that caused that spike during the day without creating anything that provides longer financial risks. Thank you. And uh, in 2018, and again in yesterday's report, FSOC outlined um, and highlighted the, that uh, ending uh, LIBOR as a reference rate um, is a concern to financial stability and recommends that member agencies work closely with market participants to identify and mitigate res uh, risks during the transition from LIBOR to SOFOR. Uh, do you believe that financial regulators are adequately prepared for this transition? Well, I can assure you that this is something that we are very, very focused on. It is a risk, uh, as you've highlighted, we've outlined. Yesterday, just as an example, Chair Powell, myself, Randy Quarles, members of the OCC, the FDIC, and others met with 10 bank CEOs to specifically talk about this issue of, of, of LIBOR and the transition. We're working closely with the SEC because we're also very concerned about securities and how securities will transition in the role of trustees. We may need to come back to Congress at some point and suggest some regulatory language and law to deal with this, but I can assure you this is one of the top risks that we are very focused on. Thank you, and thank you for your response on my request on the financial transaction tax as well. We'll follow up.
Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is recognized for five minutes. Oh. <laughs> Why did I, I believe your statement is accurate for at least a week. <laughs> Why did you give me this? <laughs> Madam Chair, you have an announcement? Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your leadership, Madam Chair. And I, I want to thank the Secretary for your, your continued leadership and support for the Corporate Transparency Act, the Beneficial Ownership Act that recently passed out of this committee with strong bipartisan support. It would not have happened without your, your support. I wanted to thank you. Uh, law enforcement in my home state, New York, and across the country considers this bill to be their top priority to combat terrorism financing and to make us safer. So I want to thank you. I, I do not think it would have passed without your support. I'm very grateful. Um, my first question concerns uh, uh, the Federal Reserve, which recently warned about the ballooning corporate debt, which sits at nearly 10 trillion. That's about half the size of our overall economy. And there is a particular focus on the growth of the near junk BBB, triple B bonds and the continued rise of leverage lending. Uh, personally, I'm very concerned that a lot of this debt is being used for financial risk-taking and stock buybacks. I, I'm also troubled to see that in the CLO market, there's been a wave of downgrades, and there are questions as to whether there's enough data on the CLO market. So I have two basic questions. First, does the FSOC has a gra have a grasp on the global leveraged uh, loan market? and specifically, who actually holds most of the outstanding CLOs? And secondly, other than monitoring, what is FSOC doing to keep the surge of, of risky uh, corporate debt in check? Thank you. First of all, thank you for your work on beneficial ownership and your acknowledgement of yeah. our contribution. We are currently working with the Senate, and we look forward to bipartisan support turning this into law. Thank you. Um, specifically, as it relates to your, your issue, uh, let me just first say that the leverage lending market is something that FSOC is very focused on. We've had several presentations at FSOC. We have a group within FSOC of all the different regulators that are looking at this. Uh, it, it's one of the things as part of an activities-based approach that we are monitoring the risk. Uh, the first issue we've examined is What's the exposure in OCC and FDIC banks? And uh, I'm pleased to report that a lot of the leverage lending has moved out of the bank market to the CLO market, as you've commented. Uh, the CLO market does have long-term capital associated with it. Uh, it is something that we're carefully monitoring. And I would also just comment, you're right, there has been a very large issuance of, of triple B bonds. Uh, I don't think that's been used for stock buybacks. Most of the stock buybacks have been done out of cash and not additional leverage, but we are monitoring the triple B market also carefully. Well, thank you. I want to make sure you use every tool available to understand their connectedness to our overall economy. Uh, you've recently talked about uh, LIBOR and SOFR in our hearing today. Do you think that the recent issues in the repo market uh, indicate that SOFR might be more volatile than anticipated. Uh, we've seen a lot of turbulence. Uh, let's raise some questions about it. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned. I mean, I am concerned about the transition from LIBOR to SOFR, and that's something that we are very focused on because it is both a regulatory issue, it's a technology issue, it's a legal issue. As it relates to SOFR and the volatility in those two days, um, over a long period of time, it, it would not have a big impact on SOFR. But the thing we like about SOFR is that it is a market that can't be manipulated, it's highly liquid, and uh, it, it's, it's demonstrated and calculated, unlike the LIBOR markets. Well, that sounds like it um, is a good move. I, I, my time has expired, or getting close to being expired, and uh, I look forward to working with you to pass the Beneficial Ownership Bill. Thank you. I yield back. 
The gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Secretary Mnuchin. Thank you for testifying for our committee today. We have seen proposals to implement a financial transaction tax in both the House and the Senate. In addition, uh, a number of Democrat presidential candidates have either endorsed or are considering a financial transaction tax. These proposals would place taxes on financial transactions typically involving stocks and uh, bonds and derivatives. This tax would result in fewer trades and will lead market participants to look for other ways to avoid the tax. This will both reduce capital gains taxes and might lead to other forms of tax evasion. Additionally, uh, a financial transaction tax has already been tried internationally, and the results have been very poor. In Italy, the tax just uh, raised 159 million euros of a targeted 1 billion, dollar Euro, or 1 billion euros in its very first year. In Sweden, a tax was imposed in the 1980s, and by 1990, more than 50 percent of all Swedish trading had moved offshore to London. While proponents of the financial transaction tax argue that it would only affect the wealthy, that is simply not the case. This tax would impact all investors, most specifically and including millions of Main Street investors saving and investing in mutual funds, a retirement account, a child's education, or maybe a pension plan. Secretary Mnuchin, what sort of impact could imposing a financial transaction tax have on the U.S. financial system? Well, th thank you for raising that issue. Uh, I, I share your concern about this potential tax. I think, as you know, the United States is the leader in financial services, in capital markets, uh, and it's something that, that people come from all over the world to raise capital in, in the United States. So I am very concerned that that would destroy our capital markets and the cost to American holders of mutual funds would bear the majority of the cost. Uh, Mr. McHenry actually also inquired yes. uh, and wrote us about this, and we've committed to do some work internally and on an interagency basis to, to study this to see if we can try to come up with uh, some, some research on what the impact would be. Do you believe it would reduce liquidity? I believe, as I said, I think it would be quite detrimental on, on many aspects, both liquidity, it would... What about volatility, market volatility? Well, I, I think kind of we may have less market volatility here because we won't have a market here. But right. you mentioned, it'll, it'll, it'll go to London and to Hong Kong and to other places where we clearly don't want it to be right now. And how would this impact overall U.S. economic growth, Secretary? It would, it would be a burden on economic growth, and, and more importantly, it would be a burden on all the American taxpayers who already pay taxes and hold mutual funds and have their savings and their retirement in, in mutual funds. Of which there are millions, as I said, of Main Street, hardworking Americans in my own second district of Missouri that would be greatly impacted by this. Um, do you, so you, could, you, could this tax result in fewer trades and lead to market participants to look for other ways to avoid the tax, the kind of tax evasion that we've seen uh, internationally in other countries? I believe it, it would. It would move money offshore. It would disproportionately hurt pensions, 401ks, and uh, people who are saving for retirement. Do you believe, sir, that the cost to the Treasury of issuing federal debt could increase because of the potential increase in trading costs and the reduction in liquidity that would occur if this tax were, in fact, imposed? Well, if the tax were put on uh, U.S. government securities, it would clearly just raise the cost of the government borrowing. There's no question. So federal debt would even be affected by this? It would. All right, thank you. Um, I, I look forward to your study, and, and we do hope uh, that FSOC will do more uh, work and research so that we can be very clear before moving forward with a, uh, a horribly regressive and detrimental uh, financial tax like this. Thank you so much for your time, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is poised to become the next chair. <laughs> <laughs>
of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair. Uh, the gentlewoman from Missouri brings out a number of concerns about a financial uh, transactions tax. Uh, there are pros and cons of that tax, but I did make a list of all the problems she had with the financial services tax, and every single one of them would be avoided with a wealth tax. So uh, I will put you in touch with the academics uh, on our side that are uh, helping Elizabeth Warren uh, produce. Yeah, the gentleman will yield. I can't wait for I, that I, debate. I, 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 don't, I will not yield because I think we know where you stand on this. Um, a lot of questions divide us ideologically. Uh, and then there are the simple ones where we can do something important for the economy and we just put it off and we put it off. And we ignore the fact that even if we get it done by the very last minute, we've caused a harm to the market. And, uh, you know, a trillion here, a trillion there, it adds up to real money. We've got LIBOR instruments out there relying on the LIBOR in, in index at the, to the tune of roughly $10 trillion. And um, the LIBOR rate will not be published, uh, or may very well not be published after 2021. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you said in your opening statement, we recommend any new instruments that reference LIBOR should include a fallback language, should include fallback language to mitigate the risk in the event that LIBOR becomes unavailable. Good. But that still leaves us with $2 trillion of the LIBOR-based contracts that will still be outstanding at the end of 2021. They've already been written. They were uh, these uh, LIBOR legacy instruments. And uh, we can't amend these instruments without the consent of every uh, uh, participant. That's impossible. Uh, I'm working on legislation uh, that would solve this problem and link uh, these LIBOR-denominated instruments uh, to uh, the secured overnight financing rate so far. But it occurs to me you might be able to tell me that uh, we don't need legislation. Does Treasury have the authority to issue regulations, or does any executive branch agency have the authority to issue regulations uh, to simply say, if you've got a LIBOR contract you, and it doesn't provide for a backup rate, here's how to do the calculations? So and if you don't have the authority, do you want the authority? Yeah, so, so first of all, again, let, let me acknowledge I agree with you. This is a bipartisan issue. This is, this is nothing that this is something we should work on. Uh, and the work on this predated me coming to Treasury. So this, this has been a, a long time. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we may come back to Congress and suggest that you pass uh, legislation. I, I would ask you, this. this is not on your 2021 calendar. This should be on your December calendar, I, I, your I January should, calendar. No, I, I agree with I you. I look I forward to, to working with you. I need to know whether you need legislation I need to know what you need, and uh, we need to make sure that there aren't $2 billion of debt instruments outstanding where people cannot determine uh, what interest is supposed to be paid. Um, and I want to move on because I do chair the Asia subcommittee uh, for another week, and uh, we focused on China. Uh, the. Uh, uh, China could end up with a billion and a half of World Bank loans. Um, uh, this is under discussion now. Um, China's income has already exceeded the level where they should be eligible for these loans. The Chinese government has enough money to put a million Uyghurs behind bars and to build a military complex that destabilizes the world. So it seems like maybe China should only be able to borrow money in the private markets at private market rates. Now, I know the United States won't support World Bank loans to China, but I'm asking, what are you doing to stop those loans? Are we simply making academic arguments, or are we making it clear that our future involvement in certain World Bank uh, activities is dependent upon not giving concessionary loans to China? So again, thank you for raising this issue, which I also think is a bipartisan uh, consensus on. So David Malpass, who's now the World Bank president, when he was working for me as undersecretary, as part of our 
reforms package we negotiated with the World Bank, with the prior leadership there. Uh, we negotiated significant reductions in China lending with the path to get below a billion. They've been below a billion this year. Yesterday, we submitted our objection to the current country plan. So we look forward to following up with you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member, for holding this uh, hearing on systemic stability. For many of us who grew up after the Great Depression, the uh, first experience we had with severe systemic instability was the last financial crisis. Um, at this time, uh, we often watched a classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where we experienced the drama of a uh, run on the banks uh, with George Bailey, the hero of the movie, played by Jimmy Stewart, uh, who saves a small town savings and loan from the bank run. The last crisis taught us that uh, we no longer live in the world of Jimmy Stewart banks. Uh, runs on other financial uh, system liabilities like money market funds may often threaten far greater consequences uh, today than bank runs. Uh, markets uh, for assets may collapse in dramatic ways and destroy the ability of financial institutions to fund their asset holdings and meet the survival constraints uh, imposed by liquidity and even solvency. Uh, we often hear the words, you can't be too careful. Uh, but the reality is that in regulating our financial system, uh, we can be so careful that we stifle its innovation, restrict credit and finance, slow economic growth, and inhibit jobs for people. Uh, we must strike a balance between the risk of return, and we must look to those uh, balanced solutions to keep our uh, economy on a path towards sustained growth. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, please let me commend you for your leadership in working with other key regulators to finalize reforms related to the proprietary trading provisions of the Vocal Rule. Uh, thank you. Uh, as you know, our banking history uh, was different from banks in England, where Banks focused on trade capital and played a limited role in long-term capital markets. Uh, in this country, uh, banks always had a role in capital markets and the investments that made our economy a mighty engine of growth, uh, the Intercontinental Railroad, shipping, and a host of other industries. Uh, I believe banks have a key role to play in venture capital, and the vocal rule is restricting that vital function. I recently joined other members of this committee in sending a letter to you and other key stability regulators uh, asking that you move quickly to issue proposed rule to amend the covered fund provisions of the Vocal Rule. Now, specifically, we ask you to revise the overly broad definition of a, quote, covered fund uh, to exclude venture capital and other long-term funds. Uh, so my, my first question for you today, uh, Mr. Secretary, is the statute makes you, uh, as chair of FEFSOC, responsible for coordinating rulemaking. Are the financial regulators and the Department of Treasury working on changes to the covered funds provision? And, and if so, could you please provide us uh, with any insight on the timing for such a proposal? Thank you. So first, let me just uh, acknowledge what you said, that, that the healthy banking system is critical to our economy, and our banks have de-risked and built up significant amounts of capital. So uh, the regulators have already made some proposed changes to the Volcker Rule that won't create undue risk, but will create more liquidity in certain markets. And we are working with them, as you've suggested, on the, the, covered, uh, the covered fund issue as well. Thank you. Uh, any, any idea what the timeline would be on that? I, I would hope it's over the next uh, 90 to 120 days, but we'll get back to you. Uh, do you expect much criticism in that regard? Uh, I'm not going to speculate, but any proposed rulemaking will be open to public comment, and we'll take those comments into Very consideration. Uh, I, was, I, was, I, I wanted to talk about some of the climate change regulations, but I've, I've only got a minute left, and just wonder if you give me your assessment on the usefulness of taking the short-term stress testing discipline into much longer uh, period realm of climate change. Does that make any sense to you? It, it does not. I'm sorry, you repeat your question, I want to make sure I heard it correctly. Okay. I said it does but, uh, not, but I want to make sure. Just wonder what your assessment is on the usefulness of taking the short-term stress testing discipline uh, into the longer-term realm of the climate change requirements. 
Well, let me just say, uh, in my vast expertise on a lot of different things, climate is not one of it. But I think the banks have a difficult enough time uh, on modeling different risks. I, I think long-term climate mm -hmm. risk is something that's subject to a lot of different views. And as long as there's proper disclosure, I think that's adequate. Very good. I thank you. And, and my time has expired. Yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, I think that we can agree, you know, as, as I said in my opening statement, I'm really concerned. I mean, it was one of the most things that shocked me uh, as a member of Congress is when Secretary Paulson came on the floor talking about that our whole economy was going to drop. And so with FSOC, we're trying to look forward to try to figure out what's going on and what will happen in the future. I have, you know, some real concerns uh, because as I look at the Chinese growth stalling, uh, as I look at the European economies are slowing with some entering recession, uh, I look at Brexit looming and what effects that Brexit may have and then all of the turmoil that is going on in Latin America you know, it gives me real concerns. And when I looked at some of the forecasts, that the American, the U.S. economy is slowing also. You know, history may not repeat itself, but sometimes it certainly rhymes. And I fear that over the next few years uh, for the economy, it may rhyme a little too much for me with, uh, with the past decade. And so I'm hoping that uh, the administration is going to look well ahead of what takes place and have certain uh, formulas that they're putting in place to, in case there is uh, uh, a, a tremendous problem. Like, when I look at the dead stock of corporations and even colleges and universities has ballooned and an important share of this debt is in the form of leveraged loans and covenant light loans. And there seems to be a real risk of a downgrade cliff and as a growing share of this debt is just barely above junk. So I'm hoping, you know, do you have some models to show what would happen to employment, home ownership, and the broader economy if these loans were downgraded in mass in the event of a downturn in the economy? And also what it would do affect and how would it affect the retail sector, for instance? Any model that you have, can you tell us? because uh, I'm really concerned about these leveraged loans that are out there. Well, for, first let me just say, uh, we share your concerns on financial stability. I worked for Secretary Paulson for a long time, and I speak to him regularly, and I hope we're never in that type of a time period again. Um, specifically, as it relates to leverage lending and covenant light, we, we do share your concerns. We are monitoring those risks. Those are the types of activities we're carefully looking at. We've studied it very carefully as it relates to the banks, and again, we're very comfortable that there's very limited exposure in the banks. Um, as it relates to uh, specifics of the impact on employment and retail sales and other areas, we'll, we'll get back to you on our thoughts on that. But again, uh, my, my view that it is, it is minimal because the exposure is outside of the banking industry and shouldn't have the type of contagion and risk that uh, occurred during the financial crisis. Thank you for that, and I do get served sometimes too because now that it is outside of the financial or the banking system, we try to put certain things in place for the banking system so that we can make sure that we see systemic risk before and we could then make sure that we can downsize and do what was necessary. But outside, where we may not, I want to make sure that we're watching what's happening on the outside also because that, I don't want us to catch us by surprise. I think that's tremendously important. I agree, and I assure you we are. So also, you know, when I looked at you know, what devastated me in, another, in this financial crisis, it's a reminder that recessions and crises don't hit all sectors of, and demographics of the economy equally. For example, if you look at my district and black and minority communities, they overwhelmingly lost wealth, lost jobs, and were foreclosed upon at disproportionately high rates, and many of them haven't fully even uh, recovered yet. In fact, two point Minority banks failed at 2.5 times the rate of non-minority uh, banks, and they've also yet to recover. 
So I was wondering, as FSOC considers systemic risk and the risk of financial disruptions, how much consideration is given to the manner in which the burden falls on low-income and minority uh, segments of the economy? And how do you quantify this, and what does uh, what is it done to seek to address this? Have you anything to, in 23 seconds to address this, if you can do it? Sure. So let, let me give you two comments, and we're happy to follow up with you uh, another time. But one, uh, housing reform is something we're very focused on, particularly because of the disproportionate impact on, on certain communities. And also on, on minority-owned banks, we have a program at Treasury where we have a mentorship program that we're working with those banks. But I look forward to following up with you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the Secretary for responding to a letter that I and 20 of my colleagues sent to you recently regarding Cecil. By looking at the minutes of FSOC's meeting yesterday, I can see that you've directed OFER to examine all current research on the matter in Port Back. Uh, I think this will enable, will enable uh, some light to be shed on the standard, which I believe is, uh, is detrimental to our industry as well as our consumers and our economy. And I'll uh, be really looking forward to following up with OFER just to make sure the process is conducted correctly and look forward to working with you to work on issues that I think are going to be pointed out by this research. So thank you for, for doing that and responding to our request. Uh, first issue I want to talk about today is with regards to uh, the new digital currency Libra that's being proposed by um, uh, Facebook. We had Mr. Zuckerberg in here recently and he explained uh, his um, intentions and how this is all going to take place. Uh, you know, since then, China has got, uh, I made an announcement with regards to their own digital currency and there's been some calls for uh, the Fed to issue its own currency and I'd just like for you to Give us your position on it and where you see it going and what your thoughts may be on it, because it, it does seem to uh, have some legs. Sure. Well, let me just comment that when people talk about digital currencies, it's a, a large, vastly different area and different, different sectors have different right. things. Specifically, as it relates to Libra, we've had probably a dozen meetings with Facebook. We've shared our concerns. It's part of the reason why they're slowing down their movement forward. We've discussed this at the G7 and the G20. Uh, I am fine if Facebook wants to get into digital payments, uh, that's fine, and that may be good for their customer base and good for a lot of Americans who don't have access to banks. We want to make sure if they do it, they're doing it in a way that is fully compliant with our BSA AML and that in no way can this be used for terrorist financing in illicit activities. Okay, but the Chinese have decided to get into this as well, and so the last half of my question was, uh, there's been some, some thought process about the Fed getting into it and having their own digital currency. Is this something you see necessary, something you don't want to get into, something that's, that shouldn't be out there? Where, 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 where do you see this going? So again, I, I would differentiate what China is doing from what a Bitcoin or a Facebook would do. What China is doing is really issuing digital currency in lieu of physical cash, and they can track all that. So it's, 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 they will be able to track where that goes. Um, that's different than a Bitcoin. It's no different than in the U.S. if, you know, money is sent on the Fed wire system, it, it can be tracked and money through SWIFT has identifiers. So, again, I would differentiate kind of what central banks are doing from what a Libra or a Bitcoin is doing. As it relates to the Fed, and Chair Powell and I have discussed this at length, I think we both agree uh, for the near future, in the next five years, we see no need for the Fed to issue digital currency, and that's because, again, we have a very uh, sophisticated system. The Fed is working on electronic payment system. We do we need to make sure they're real-time electronic payment system in the U.S., but thank you for your concerns. Okay. Uh, appreciate the response. Yesterday, we had a hearing here in, in the committee, and there were a number of questions with regards to credit unions buying out banks. It seems that that is a, a little bit of a trend here in the last uh, 12 to 14 months. In fact, the comment was made yesterday that I think there was 28 that have already been purchased this year, with another 14 more in the hopper, I understand. Um, you know, as the IRS is in your purview, Mr. Secretary, uh, this means that those 28 banks, plus perhaps this other 14, are going to come off the rolls as taxpayers. Um, it's going to dent the Treasury some, not obviously not much, but it'd be some. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any resistance from the standpoint of the FDIC and 
or the credit union regulators to not allow this to happen. So it's continuing to be approved, it's continuing to happen. Um, <clears throat> you know, in fact, I was having a discussion last night with somebody, and they said, well, maybe the banks need to start buying credit unions, throw the charter out the window, become a credit union, and they can avoid taxes. So I don't know that that's doable, but I, there's some people starting to think outside the box because they're looking at this as a tax loophole. So from your standpoint, do you see concerns from the standpoint of credit unions buying out banks? Is this just another part of a, the merger situation that's going on in this country, or is there is a trend? Is it a, is it a tax evasion situation? Uh, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you view this? <clears throat> well, we'll follow up with the FDIC on this issue and, and monitor it. It's not something that's caught my attention because fortunately it's on still small scale. But I appreciate you raising the concern and we'll follow up with the FDIC. This past week there was an announcement of a $700 million bank that was bought out by a $10 billion yes. credit union. So this is going to continue to grow and it's going to be a concern. I think it needs to be on your radar. Thank you for your response. Sir. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, is recognized for five minutes. Secretary Manichin, how are you? <clears throat> I want to make sure I'm clear on your level of concern about the continued volatility in the repo market and its impact on the calculation of SOFR, the secured overnight financing rate, which as you know is a designated replacement rate for LIBOR. Now, I've listened to your response to Mr. McHenry and also to um, um, the gentle lady from New York. And I want to be clear because I read your report, the FCC, the F, uh, uh, F, F, F Sox 2019 Financial Stability Report. Here's what you said. You said that market participants with significant exposure to LIBOR remain vulnerable if they do not sufficiently prepare all the way to the end of 2021. What did you mean for that? And what did you mean about prepare? What are you doing to help the industry participators prepare? Um, well, again, let me just emphasize two different issues that are related in a way, as you said. Uh, I am concerned what happened in the repo markets. That's not just a concern for SOFR. That's a broader concern because we rely on these repo markets and many, it impacts many, many individuals and institutions. So we've had active discussions with the Fed on that issue. That does impact the LIBOR transition, but the LIBOR transition is a much broader problem. And as I said, as recent as yesterday, we convened a group of the banks and the regulators on this. So, so what did you mean by they will remain vulnerable? Well, if, 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 if banks and trustees and security holders don't prepare for the transition, uh, there are trillions of dollars that people could wake up in 2021. And by prepare, you mean to do what? Uh, it, it's, it's a list of everything from prepare technology so that they have the ability, prepare the legal analysis, prepare a transition. People literally have hundreds of thousands of transactions. And as I said, part of this may be coming back to Congress and asking you to pass legislation in, in, in part of this, because there, there may be serious legal issues that we're still exploring. Now, let me turn and let's go uh, overseas for a moment. I want, I'm very concerned about Brexit and the particular uh, impact that Brexit will have on our businesses, on our financial markets, particularly because of the uncertainty we are seeing around the whole deal of delays after delays and the failure of them to come up with a clean deal. So uh, what I want to get from you as our Treasury Secretary, how concerned are you about this situation with Brexit and its impact that this uncertainty is having on our cross-border 
transactions with our financial market participants? Well, I would describe I'm moderately concerned. Um, I've been discussing this issue for the past three years with my counterparts at the Bank of England, as well as the regulators and the, the finance minister, who's the chancellor of the exchequer. Um, it is a significant risk to the UK. Um, it is a, it could have carry-on risk to the U.S. We're working with the regulators on those risks. We've managed through some of those, and some of those are, are, are still open. But uh, as I've encouraged the U.K., they need to resolve this one way or another. Now, also in your report concerning that, you said this. You said that, um, and you highlight the potential for risk and that they will have significant spillover effects in the United States should there be a no-deal Brexit, particularly with regard to the cross-border transactions. Uh, what did you mean by that? Um, what would be the potential with no deal? What would be better for us or worse, no deal or deal, in your mind? Well, let me just say I respect the people of the UK. They can decide whether they want to be in Brexit or they don't want to be in Brexit. The risk is making sure that whichever case there's a coordinated transition. Thank you, Ms. Sector. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Secretary, for appearing before this committee one last time before year's end. Secretary Mnuchin. In the Council's annual report, it recommended that government and private sector should have more effective information sharing practices. Could you expand on how agencies can best work with financial institutions to address cyber security concerns without inhibiting the growth of emerging technologies? So as, as I highlighted in my opening comments, uh, cyber security is one of my most important priorities. Um, I, while I think the industry is well prepared, we can never be prepared enough. Uh, the, the bad people continue to operate. Uh, we need to make sure that our financial markets are not only protected for today, but are protected for the future. And it's a coordinated response between private companies, public companies, the intel community, uh, as, as well as the Treasury and the regulators. Secretary. In what ways is FSOC and its members educating the general public on cybersecurity risk, particularly, as you noted, uh, those coming from bad actors and bad actors abroad, too? Well, our, our focus is less on educating the general public and more making sure that the banks are educated, they have the best practices. The general public will be, pro will be protected as long as the banks and the financial system is protected. And that's what we, we work on every single day. One last question, and thinking of my colleague uh, discussing Brexit for a moment, uh, you're in a unique position with your finger on the national economy, a business person of much uh, experience. Could you speak for a moment about the potentially how much better the USMCA deal is for American workers and uh, why it's essential for the economy that we act swiftly on that in this body? I mean, first of all, let me say, I, I hope that uh, Congress passes this between now and the end of the year. I know Ambassador Lighthizer, the Speaker, and others are working closely on this. And this will be a terrific win for American workers, for the American economy. Our largest trading partners are Mexico and Canada. Um, these economies are interlinked. This is a great step for growth. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, good to see you. I'm over here. Um, my questions are going to go back towards that uh, repos, the repurchases, because there are some flags here. And, you know, last year, banks had the most profits they've had in forever, uh, in part because of the, the big tax cuts and stuff like that. But huge profits, and at the same time, we saw the excess reserves of the banks decline by 35% since 2017, and at the same time, as the Fed and Treasury were sort of shrinking the balance sheet, 
all of a sudden over the last few months have had to expand it again. I don't understand how those all come together. And if you could try explaining it again, I'd appreciate it because we got big profits, shrinking reserves, and now expansion of the balance sheet again. That, those are the kinds of things that I think we have FSOC in place to monitor. So what is it that is really driving this on a, on a bigger scale, if you could tell us? So I'm happy to address it again because it is a very important issue and I don't want to minimize it. And again, as recently as yesterday at FSOC, we had a presentation from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I think there's a lot of different issues that came together on those two days that caused the spike. It was not any one single issue, but we are studying it carefully to make sure that this doesn't occur again and to make sure it doesn't occur on a prolonged basis. Um, the banks are having very good profits, mainly because of the U.S. economy is performing very well. I, I don't think this has to do with an issue of bank profits. This has to do with an issue of bank liquidity. The banks had plenty of liquidity. So the banks had enough liquidity to go in and, and take up the, the, the repo, but they didn't want to do it. And the reason they didn't want to do it had to do with different regulatory tests that fit together. So it wasn't, the liquidity test was fine, it was different ratios that they were worried about hitting and tripping. Uh, so again, this was partially a treasury issue of tax day, it was partially a regulatory issue, it was partially a reserves issue. And then just to comment, as you said, the, the Fed has been shrinking the balance sheet, which I think makes sense because as they went out of quantitative easing. It, they didn't need a, a giant. That was for the financial crisis. And what they're doing now doesn't impact the growth of the balance sheet by buying securities. It's really a cash management function around the repo markets. But it, these are all very complicated issues that were intertwined and we continue to work. Well, and I, but those were sort of the things that led up to the recession 10 years ago that all of a sudden there was this illiquid setting of our banks. And then everybody started getting nervous and the auction rate securities went to heck and everything else started closing in. And I guess it just doesn't add up for me. We're making money over here, but we're shrinking, but all of a sudden the reserves are shrinking like crazy. We, we try to shrink the balance sheet but now we're expanding it again, and it isn't just two days. It's been happening for several months now. Again, I can assure you that the, the technical issues that happen around this have nothing to do with the financial crisis. The financial crisis was driven primarily by real losses, okay, in real estate markets and highly leveraged securities. This issue, this is all about the government repo market. And, and again, when we talk about the reserves at the bank, the excess reserves, most of those excess reserves are locked up at the Fed because of regulations that require the banks to have so much excess liquidity. But let me slow you down that. for a second, because as we, I asked my staff to just kind of give me some numbers on student loans, on auto loans, and on corporate debt. I mean, we're at $1.6 trillion in student loans, 44 million Americans have student loans, 29, almost 30,000 the average debt. Auto loans were at 1.26 trillion, 107 million Americans have auto loans, 7 million Americans are more than three months behind. And corporate debt, we're at 10 trillion, 1.3 trillion in leveraged loans, 1.2 trillion in junk bonds. I mean, there's, there's a lot of lending going on out there. And so the question is, are we getting overextended again? And that's what I'm worried about. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, is recognized for uh, five minutes. Ms. Secretary, did you want to answer that? Thank you. What I, what I, I was just going to comment on is I think it's a good thing that we have a lot of lending, a healthy economy. And, and uh, again, I really do think that this, this bank issue is a highly technical issue, but it is something we are very focused on. And uh, student loans, that's a longer subject that we're, we're studying carefully. We share certain concerns on the student loan market right now. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and appreciate you taking the time to be able to be here and speaking to that specific point, uh, the ability to be able to have access to capital, to be able to get this economy moving. And, uh, you know, I think it's worthy of note, in the first thousand days uh, that you've been in office with President Trump, you've been able to implement historic tax reform, uh, to be able to take extraordinary steps, to be able to safeguard national security, making strides to being a better steward of taxpayer dollars. And it's important to note that our, our free market system, uh, with the help of tax reform and other deregulatory policies that have come out of Congress and the Trump administration, have helped to be able to stimulate my state's economy in Colorado. Uh, in the past year alone, Colorado employers have created 43,800 jobs. Nearly 67,000 Coloradoans have found jobs. Uh, in fact, in my state, the unemployment rate is at 2.6%. Uh, as you noted in your testimony, we are at a 50-year low on unemployment in this uh, economy right now. We have policies that are actually making this capitalistic system work. Uh, Main streets in rural America is a primary concern to me. That is my district. Uh, and as you probably know, in many cases, when we're looking at economic recovery after downturns, it's rural America that is last to come out of that recovery. And if another downturn comes, they're the first to be able to lead the way in uh, to distressed economies. And I'm really pleased to be able to report to you in my district, we're now starting to see property move in some of these rural areas. We're starting to see the economies move, jobs being created through the opportunity of our system, and appreciate the efforts that you and the administration have made to be able to address that. Would you agree when we look at the overall economy, uh, low unemployment, historic low unemployment in so many of the demographic groups that we have, the opportunity that we're seeing in this country, is this a good positive sign for my state of Colorado and for America as a whole? It is indeed, and it's actually the bright spot of global growth. And I think that's something that's going to be important for us as a Congress, as a nation, uh, to be able to keep our eyes on. Uh, you know, despite some of this historic growth, uh, we have some of our colleagues across the Capitol and governor's mansions across the country uh, that are trying to upend our capitalistic system. Uh, that has benefited the majority of Americans in this country. Uh, the economic engine that we have in this nation is something to be celebrated and to create those opportunities in front of us. We should not be pursuing socialistic policies to be able to redistribute income, to be able to slow that down, uh, but rather policies that are going to be making sure that every American has that opportunity to be able to reach their highest and best potential, as God has given them the ability to be able to do. Uh, I'd like to be able to encourage you and, uh, and the administration to be able to continue those policies that are creating opportunity for so many Americans, uh, to be able to reject those who are going to be seeking to be able to redistribute income, to build out bigger government, more programs, rather empowering people with their own resources to be able to build for that bigger, better, and brighter future. Appreciate you again taking the opportunity to be able to be here today and for your work on this economy. And, uh, want to wish you and your family the best to, for the holidays. Thank you. Now yield back. Back. Thank you. Gentleman from Colorado yields back. The gentleman from uh, Connecticut, Mr. Himes, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, I'd love to use my five minutes to have you reflect a little bit on shadow banking and in particular the intersection of shadow banking and the mortgage system. I'm of a tenure, I was sworn in in January of 09 when this committee wasn't sure that uh, Citibank, for example, would, uh, would remain solvent until probably a couple of quarters had gone by and all the implications. And of course, so much of that was uh, due to irresponsible underwriting in the mortgage market. Uh, in your report, which I've not had a ton of time to absorb, but um, um, you actually make specific mention, uh, and in fact, box B, non-bank mortgage origination servicing here. The message is pretty clear, which is that non-banks are now originating, it looks like more or less the, uh, than half of mortgages, and those mortgages are disproportionately, significantly disproportionately going into the GSEs. That makes me nervous because, of course, the GSEs are guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States, American taxpayer, this feels to me like a little bit of a replay in which 
institutions that maybe don't have the underwriting discipline of banks are out there writing a lot of mortgages, sure that those mortgages will then be securitized. So I have a sort of a general question and then a specific question. My general question is, what sort of visibility do you think you and the other regulators have into the quality of the uh, overall underwriting and, and, and uh, uh, specifically, um, we spent a lot of time in this committee and, and tried to reflect in Dodd-Frank the notion of retention, meaning you actually eat your own cooking with respect to the underwriting. And I have a suspicion that a lot of these non-banks are actually not retaining exposure, but that in fact they're transferring it to the GSEs. So generally, what kind of visibility do you have? And more specifically, are these non-banks underwriting competently? So let me say, uh, we do have concerns, and that's why we've highlighted it. The, the, the good news is we do have visibility, and the main reason we have visibility, as you pointed out, a lot of these loans are being sold to the GSEs. A lot of these loans are being guaranteed by FHA. So one of the things we want to do as part of housing reform is we are concerned both at FHA and at G, the GSEs that the underwriting criteria is deteriorating and the loan to values are increasing. So we are working with the FHFA and we're working with HUD on those issues. The other area of concern that we have is that the mortgage servicing business, which used to be dominated by banks, is now dominated by non-banks. And one of the problems is the non-banks don't have the liquidity to advance on mortgages that the banks had. So this is something that FSOC is very carefully studying. I can also tell you on uh, my role as being on the FHFA board, we're also studying this as well. Uh, I would say it's, it's not at the point where we're nervous of the levels that it was 10 years ago, but it, it is a significant concern and that's why we're carefully following it. And we'll come back with additional recommendations. And I think there's a lot that both HUD can do and FHFA can do to cut down these risks. So l let me follow up. You've got a sentence here in box B that says that, says that loans originated by non-bank lenders have on average marginally higher debt to income ratios and lower borrower credit scores than those originated by banks. So it feels to me, and again, I haven't had a chance to study this, but it feels to me like there's a little bit of adverse selection going on here in as much as lower credit mortgages are being guaranteed by the GSEs but that the higher quality mortgages are perhaps staying outside of the GSE structure. Am I, am I right in inferring that from the report? Not, not, not necessarily, but what is occurring, because a lot of the loans are that the banks are originating are being sold to the GSEs, but if you look at the loans that the banks are originating, they're better quality loans than the non-banks. So if you look at what the GSEs are buying, the, the higher loan to level are, are from the non-banks, and we're concerned about that. Now, the good news is, the bank regulators made sure that banks weren't originating ba bad loans in, in just selling them. So that, that goes back to your original comments. And, and by the way, these should be bipartisan concerns. These, these should concern all of us. No, no, I, I, I completely agree. And, and I'm glad to see this focus. I would, I would emphasize again, just drawing on what it felt like. You know, my own state of Connecticut has only now in the aggregate recovered economically from the impact of what occurred in 07 and 08. So I appreciate you highlighting this. And I hope that uh, if you need us uh, to help with either GSE reform or whatever, that, that we, you, we will be involved rather than surprised. And I yield back the balance of my time. We do need your help on GSE reform. So we look forward to working with you. Gentleman from Connecticut yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to have you here, Mr. Secretary. Full disclosure again, uh, car dealer, retailer, Main Street, and Texas. And uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, come up here to answer these questions. Uh, by my count, this is the fourth time that you have uh, appeared before this committee. And I know I've asked you this question before. Uh, but this is politics, and things up here in Washington seem to change hour by hour, minute by minute. Uh, so before I continue with my questions, I must ask you again, are you a capitalist or a socialist? I'm pleased to report I'm still a capitalist. Pleased to hear that. Thank you. Now, while our country is moving in the right direction economically, I'm worried that we are not paying enough attention to the national debt which recently surpassed $23 trillion. The net interest payment on this debt is estimated to reach around $400 billion during this fiscal year and could account for over 10% of the GDP by the end of 2020. 
Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell stated in November that our debt is, is on an unsustainable path that will cripple our ability to respond to a recession. In addition, Chairman Powell's comments, I've heard from former senior military officers, including some who served at Fort Hood in my district, uh, that, our that our debt is one of the greatest national security threats that they see facing the nation. So the fact is we need to cut government spending. And we need to get serious operating within our means. So, Mr. Secretary, can you elaborate on the threat that our mounting national debt has on financial stability? Well, I would say that today it doesn't have much of a threat because we are the reserve currency of the world. And I think relative to the size of the GDP, it's sustainable. But what I would say is we need to grow our revenues faster than we grow our expenses. And I think, as you know, when the president came in, he presented a balanced budget. He wanted to increase military spending and decrease non-military to pay for it. Um, to get a bipartisan deal done, we increased both. Uh, I was part of with Speaker Pelosi just negotiating the recent deal. But over time, we need to look at government spending. Uh, it's no secret economic growth has been slowing throughout the world. Uh, the International Monetary Fund revised its global growth estimates down to 3% for 2019, uh, when just two years ago the world's economy was growing at a rate of 3.8%. But even as the global growth slows, the United States uh, continues to outperform other developed economies, as you've talked about today, uh, across the globe. And I can tell you again, being in the retail business, uh, being on Main Street America, business is as good as I've ever seen it, and I appreciate that. So. Secretary Mnuchin, what factors are contributing to our growth outpacing our European counterparts? Well, I, I think there's no question it's the economic policies of the Trump administration. It's been a combination of tax cuts, regulatory relief, and, and better trade deals, and that, that's what we're focused on. Uh, unemployment currently, as we know, exists at 3.6 percent. Earlier this year, the Top economists at Goldman Sachs predicted that this number could fall to as low as 3.25 by the end of 2020. So what concrete actions would you recommend we take in Congress to help make this prediction become a reality? I would uh, suggest you continue on bipartisan support of USMCA. That's the most important thing on the economic side that Congress can do between now and the end of the year. Totally agree with you. Uh, data security is one of the greatest threats to our financial system as our economy becomes more digital. Uh, because of congressional inaction, many states have adopted uh, their own data privacy standards. Unfortunately for many businesses in my district, they are going to be forced to comply with uh, various uh, standards in order to operate their businesses in all 50 states. So I know you've addressed this before, but is it as important for the businesses in my district that we talk about this? What would be the value of having a single federal data security standard? I think it's something we should very carefully look at. I mean, just as there are national banking standards, I think data is, is something that's very critical. And also, by the way, this is an issue on a global basis. Um, we want to make sure that localization doesn't stymie growth in, in transactions. Uh, before I close, again, thanks for being here. I wanted to applaud the Treasury Department's work uh, in standing up for U.S. interest during recent negotiations with European regulators over insurance capital standards. Uh, we cannot allow bureaucrats in Brussels uh, to write unworkable rules and regulations that would hurt insurance companies in our country. So keep up the good work, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas yields back. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Mnuchin. Um, there are so many new emerging threats to financial stability today from, you know, cryptocurrency projects such as Libra to ballooning levels of corporate debt, uh, leveraged lending, um, questions about the accuracy of the ratings from bond rating agencies. Uh, in addition to climate-related risks, the concentration of cloud services providers, just a very long list. And that's why I'm very concerned that the Treasury's budget and staffing levels for FSOC and the Office of Financial Research have been greatly reduced under your watch. And compared to FY2017 budgets, the Trump administration's FY2020 budget would result in about half the staff for FSOC and the OFR. So, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, do you really think that it was a, is a wise idea to cut the FSOC and OFR staff levels in half? I, I, I do, and the reason for that is because, uh, one, you, you've been successfully increasing our Treasury staff uh, outside of, of FSOC. 
as well as the other regulators. So we, we rely upon, the one of the things that FSOC does is, I think it can have a smaller group of core people, and most of the work is done on a coordinated basis through all of the agencies. So that's really why we're comfortable doing that, and we're trying to be prudent on expenses. All right, well, it seems very short-sighted to me, to me to cut the resources that are desperately needed to make sure uh, that we even reduce the risk of the sort of financial crisis that we live through. Um, so you're unwilling to commit to doing anything to restore those budgets, is that correct? I'd never say I'm unwilling to commit. We're happy to come up and explain to you what our thinking is. Again, okay. we're just trying to save taxpayer dollars. We're not trying to do anything that would create more financial stability. If we thought we needed those resources, we'd keep them. Well, all right. I, I believe that we need to give FSOC and, and the OFR uh, funding and personnel they need to carry out the, that what I regard as their very important missions. And that's why I've introduced the Enhanced Financial Stability Research and Oversight Act, uh, which I'm hopeful that we're going to be marking up in in committee within a, a few weeks here. Um, this is a common sense measure that just tries to restore the minimum funding levels that we had in 2017. It's uh, pretty simple because I, you know, we cannot uh, foresee and prevent the next crisis if we do not have the personnel around to actually do the work, including the coordination uh, of collecting the data, analyzing the risk, and performing the essential research. Um, anyway. So that's, I, I just hope my colleagues will uh, support me in this important effort. This is, I think, short-sighted uh, to, to cut back those essential functions. Um, you know, another point that I alluded to earlier is that increasingly big tech firms like Amazon, Google, and others are pushing into financial services and products, including cloud computing services uh, for the largest banks. And according to the recent readout of, of the EPSOC meeting, uh, cloud computing was a topic of discussion. So my first question is, in your view, does FSOC have an, the authority it needs to designate a cloud provider as being either a non-bank SIFI or a systemically important financial market utility? So at this point, and this is a very fact-specific situation, at this point the answer is no, but it is something we've discussed at the FSOC. And, and do you have the authority if you come to the conclusion that they should be designated that if, you feel if we, you if have If we the came to the conclusion. Right. Okay, you know, I, I have a, a real worry that the concentration of cloud providers, um, you know, it would be an interesting uh, thought experiment to say what happens if, uh, for, if, for example, there was a not too long ago a story in Bloomberg about the possibility that uh, Chinese had, had put little hardware bugs in very widely used uh, equipment inside cloud utilities. And so if that is discovered at a single cloud utility where they have to replace a big fraction of their hardware and have to be down for potentially months while that happens, uh, this, you know, to actually think what that would do to our economy if AWS went down for, for a month or two. Well, as I highlighted earlier, cybersecurity is a big focus of ours. And part of the reason why we're focused on the, the cloud is because we share your concerns. We want to make sure that no one financial institution is dependent and would be taken down by a, a cloud provider. And, and let's see, in my remaining time, I, do, I just want to thank you for your response to the letter that Congressman Lodermilk and I sent to you uh, having to do with uh, uh, digital identity solutions. Um, and I think that there is an essential government role there uh, that to, to leverage, as was the administration's position, to leverage the Real ID Act to allow citizens who wish to have a way to uh, authenticate themselves in a secure manner online. I think that that's a fundamental necessity in a modern economy. I think there's an essential job for the federal government to provision that basic identity and many opportunities for the private sector to leverage additional, uh, additional features on top of that. So I want to thank you for your response and encourage you to continue. Gentleman from back. Illinois yields back. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Great to have you back to the committee. Appreciate all of your leadership, and I just was uh, so interested in listening today. The thanks for the regulators that we talked to yesterday for their swift implementation of S-2155 on regulatory reform. We appreciate Treasury's leadership on that. Your work on strict sanctions uh, around the world on Venezuela, North Korea, Iran, Russia. You've de demonstrated a lot of leadership uh, there. And of course, tax reform that's been talked about extensively. So we're grateful for your leadership as our Treasury Secretary. Uh, I want to turn and 
mention a couple of things that have, we've talked about today. On the, on the repo market that uh, Mr. Perlmutter talked about in the ranking member, I think the concern is that uh, the New York Fed's not uh, supporting uh, the repo market. They are the repo market. I think that's the challenge. Uh, and we don't see the bank reserves that are more than adequate, billions more than needed, uh, on JP, uh, JP Morgan, for example, $120 billion in daily cash held at the Fed on a $60 billion cash requirement, and yet they're not entering that repo market. So I'm pleased that, uh, that yesterday at the FSOC meeting you talked about this, because I do think supervision is an issue here and the stigma attached with something that was a regular part of our business lives, which is running a daily, interday, daylight overdraft uh, at the Fed. On mortgage servicing, I appreciated your comment there. Again, that, that business shifted out of the bank sector to the non-bank sector because of Dodd-Frank. And for five years that I've served in Congress, I've tried to get the uh, Obama administration and the now Trump administration to support the idea that mortgage servicing rights are not a derivative that should be treated in that manner. It's a natural, as you know from your long career in mortgage finance, a natural companion to the origination of residential mortgages. So I hope FSOC will lend its weight uh, that allow mortgage servicing uh, to not have the capital penalty that they have uh, in, in Dodd-Frank. Uh, and on with uh, Mr. Foster, he and I have uh, had a lot of conversations about digital currencies. Uh, Jay Powell just answered our letter on the idea of a digital token. And I think the uh, concept's a, a little misunderstood. If we want a digital future in finance and we want to protect the preeminence of the American dollar as a reserve currency, this idea of a digital token is an important concept. And it's not uh, anything except allowing our government to facilitate a blockchain transaction process legally in the future. We have Visa Debit, we have MasterCard, we have SWIFT, Fedwire, the ACH system, all true all have private sector participation in them and government participation. But this idea that there's a new rail created that's a blockchain rail that both bank and non-banks can participate in to settle transactions through a token, it's coming our way faster than we like, perhaps faster than the five-year time frame you outlined. So I do think it's an important issue for the FSOC to continue to consider and also to have Treasury's view on independent of what uh, your agent over at the Federal Reserve uh, thinks as you implement Article I's power on uh, currency. Let me turn and ask you uh, a question about uh, uh, World Bank issues that we were, uh, we had a hearing a few weeks ago at the subcommittee on uh, that topic, multilateral development institutions. There was no Treasury representative. We had an illness that day. And one thing I talked about in the hearing is the legislative mandates that are put on our managing director and our governor to direct votes at the Fed. So my question to you, Mr. Secretary, do you, are you concerned that uh, that kind of governance uh, to support or oppose a financing project ties the hands of the United States in leading at the bank due to being forced to abstain on voting? I am. And uh, does Treasury have an amount, a record of those abstentions and that long uh, binder, I understand, of rules that uh, our governor has to follow? And is that something you could share with the committee and help educate the committee? Well, we, we can come back to you on that. It's a huge bureaucracy running, running all these tests, and we keep the data so we can get yeah. back to you. What, what I hear both from uh, your former colleague, Mr. Malpas, and others is that it just reduces America's effectiveness to lead the bank. So I think we'd be very interested in working with Treasury on a way to reduce those mandates, fine-tune the mandates, remove ones that are redundant, and have your leadership on that. Is that something you'd be interested in, in helping us on? We look forward to working with you. Good. I thank you. I yield back. Gentleman from Arkansas yields back. And before I recognize the gentlelady from Ohio, uh, I think we all want to wish the gentleman from Arkansas a happy 29th birthday. This is how I wanted to, to celebrate it. <laughs> All right, I'd like to recognize now for five minutes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. Thank you to our witness, Mr. Secretary. And, and let me start out by saying thank you for the information that I received uh, from you 
on working with your Amhui director, looking at the diversity uh, information, and that was very much appreciated. So thank you. Um, today, Mr. Secretary, I wanted to share with you in yesterday's hearing with Prudential regulators, several of my colleagues, including Congressman Cleaver, raised the issue of minority depository institutions, specifically with the rate that they're disappearing. And since, as you know, the financial crisis of 2008, the number of MDIs fell 31%. At the end of 2018, we only had 149 of these institutions left. MDIs are incredibly important to the minority community that they operate in. And so I'm introducing legislation today uh, to codify the Treasurer's Financial Agent Manager, Mentor Protege Program, and it's known as the Expanding Opportunities for MDIs Act. And I also want to say that I was just, it was just brought to my attention that your staff had sent my office some comments and technical assistance on the bill last night, so I am very appreciative to that. And so can you briefly describe what the Treasury's financial agent mentoring program will seek to uh, accomplish and how your department came up with it? Well, for, first of all, th th thank you very much, and we uh, we're glad to assist on this. The, the protege program has has worked very well, and the the idea is to partner a minority bank with a large bank, and in that way, the minority bank can get resources and training and help uh, to to run their business. And we share your concern. I think there should be an increase in opportunities for minority banks, not 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 a decrease. Uh, so this is something I'm, I'm pleased. Uh, I personally wrote and asked many of the big CEOs to help on this, and we look forward to, I know we, we did work with you on some technical issues, and we look forward to continuing helping you on this. Well, I, I want to say thank you. And was there a specific need that you thought you had to send the letters to the big banks? Do you think it would help them to be more engaged to do it, or because you felt they weren't doing anything? No, they, they, they were pleased. So I'd say, you know, kind of when we asked people to go into this protege program, um, people have been very receptive and, and it's worked. And we look to scale this up and we look to work with you on your potential legislation. Well, thank you, because we have noticed that some of the larger banks who I have been very critical of, uh, their lack of working, uh, uh, increasing enough with their CRAs, participating on diversity and inclusion. So I, I would like to say, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member, people ask us all the time, why do you talk so much about diversity and inclusion? And it is beyond just hiring people because of their race or ethnicity or gender. It's, it's also about if you have someone in the room and you're mentoring and you're working with people, it, it helps with the economy, it helps with jobs. Therefore, it crosses over that people can pay for their housing because we have a lack of affordable housing. It helps them with health care. It helps them with uh, daycare and child care if they are in the room. So I, again, would like to say thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back the rest of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for appearing today. Uh, we've had questions today about the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, and I, if I can ask you just in, in layman's terms, what is the effect to the economy if, in fact, Congress does pass the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement? And, and conversely, what is the effect on the economy if we fail to pass the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement? I'd say if, if we pass it, we estimated that it's in excess of 50 basis points a year in, in GDP, which is very significant. This would create additional jobs. This would create additional revenue for the government, additional revenue for consumer and businesses. And it modernizes trade with our two most important trading partners. I'm not going to speculate on what would happen if you don't pass it, because I'm highly encouraged you will. Uh, I'd like to share your enthusiasm, and I, I appreciate that. You, uh, 
received a question from, from Mr. Williams of, of Texas about the data localization and, and whether there should be a federal standard. If I could, though, I'd like to ask you about India. I know that you were recently in India, and we've read the press accounts about how um, India is trying to raise the raise the bars as it relates to um, to the data localization and the and frankly the restrictions on free trade as it relates to um, startups and other other companies. Can you talk about what the barriers are for U.S. companies? Uh, operating now in, in India and, and what effect that could have? Um, well, I I again, in my, in my recent trip, we've had uh, very specific conversations. We've been dealing with them over the last year on this issue. Uh, we want to make sure, one, that U.S. companies are treated fairly and can compete. We have no issues with if countries want to have local data for regulatory purposes, they do that. It's the issue of then eliminating data outside. And I think, as you know, we, we, we're in a global economy. We're in a scenario where data transfers, that data is processed in different places. Um, so th this, this is a, a, a complicated issue that we continue to work on to make sure that our financial services companies are treated fairly. Uh, not only financial services companies, but also other companies that are operating in India as well. That, that is correct. And Treasury continues to work with, with the officials in India on that? We do, and, and uh, we're also working very closely with USTR because it's a trade issue. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we've talked about the, the benefits of the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which no doubt has been a tremendous benefit to our, to our economy and, and to our folks who live in, in the 8th Congressional District in Tennessee and across the, across the country. One thing that uh, we may not have gotten right in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is the, uh, is the quip as, as it relates to depreciation. And I, I think that's a technical fix, trying to resolve that. Can you talk about the, the effect of, of trying to resolve that in terms of, uh, in terms of depreciation from 39 to 15 years? So uh, let, let me just say this is something that I hope this committee uh, and, and, and others will help us with on a bipartisan basis. This was clearly a technical mistake. And what happened for retailers was due to a, literally a technical mistake in the drafting, the amortization became longer as opposed to shorter. And I think everybody acknowledges on a bipartisan basis this was a technical mistake. And this impacts an area of the economy, which is retailers. It's a big part of the economy. Uh, we've been trying to get this fix. Uh, I, I would hope it's something that uh, Congress next year will reconsider helping us work on. It was a simple mistake, and, and no, nobody is debating that. From your standpoint at Treasury, it's something that, that should be resolved sooner rather than later, or you would hope would be resolved sooner it's, rather it's than later. It's our number one, two, and three technical fix request. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Tennessee yields back. The, Mr. Heck from Washington is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I want to join with my friend from Texas, Mr. Williams, in expressing my appreciation for the role that Treasury played in the international insurance negotiations. I happen to be one who believes that we ought to keep faith with the McCarran Ferguson Act, and that is the best way to have a well-regulated, consumer-oriented insurance market. I think it's worked well, so thank you, sir. I'm also grateful that uh, my friend across the aisle raised the issue of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. I'd like to ask you about it. Obviously, at the time, small technical fixes necessary notwithstanding, and I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. I hope we, as well that we get to it, that we were promised a, a that it would be a game changer. Actually, those were your words. This is going to be a game changer for business. And it was broadly held as something that would lead to increased business investment. It hasn't. There's the chart. Uh, that's the chart of the Bureau of Economic Analysis revealing that we've basically had six quarters of a significantly downward trend of business investment and capital. And uh, I'm going to ask you why you think that is and what it is you think we ought to do about it, especially given the promises that were made. 
But I want to say, first of all, about why I care about this. Uh, I think it's pretty clearly established that there's a close relationship between increased productivity and increased wages. And let's face it, the data is in. We've been fairly stuck on wage growth for the better part of 30 years in this country. And while it's beginning to inch up, it's not really material in that increase. Every upward trend is appreciated, but we still do not have wage growth. And presumably, we do not have wage growth because we do not have increased productivity, presumably because we do not have increased business investment, which we were promised. So, Mr. Secretary, why not, and what should we do about it? Well, first of all, um, I agree 100 percent with you on the impact of, of wage growth. That's been one of our priorities. I kind of disagree with you. I, I think it actually has been significant. So I, I think that for the first time in, in the last 10 years, we've seen wages growing and, and growing at a level that is meaningful to, to taxpayers. Um, I think we've Would also- Would you care to cite the data? Because it is not over consecutive quarters significantly outpace consumer price index. And this is coming on the heels, I might, remind you, sir, of basically 30 years with flatline. I, again, I'm, I'm happy to, we're happy to give you the charts, but for the, with, there's no question that wage growth, okay, has been increasing and inflation has been very low. So we're happy to get back to you the, the data. And that, and that's but the it. question is the, the, that downward arrow. On, on, we, we were promised an upward arrow. We haven't gotten it. To be honest it. with you, I can't really read that uh, chart other than I can read the capital spending. And do you but, see uh, the blue arrow? I, I got the blue That's arrow. That's not good, I, sir. I got the blue arrow. Um, That's I business say, investment. Well, again, I don't know how you're calculating that business investment. I'm not. The Bureau of Labor Statistics is. Well, you've obviously picked a slide that demonstrates a dramatic decrease. We're happy to come back to you with our own data. You know, one of my no, favorite adages no is that some people use uh, facts and figures the way a drunk uses a lamppost to lean on, not to illuminate. I assure you, sir, I have not done that. These are the Bureau of Economic Analysis data. It's six consecutive quarters. I haven't in any way reshaped the bar graph or the line or the data in any way. We're on a downward tread in business investment and capital equipment, even though we were promised as a consequence of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that it would flower. And we need it for increased productivity, for real increases in wages. Why haven't we got it? You promised it to us. Mr. Hack, first of all, we are the only economy in the world that is showing continued growth. That is not coincidental. We are showing additional jobs. Economic growth at 2% wages. now? Uh, again, That's that, what you're that, bragging that, about as a revised 2% uh, forecast? Again, those numbers, if you'd let me respond. Please. Was just screaming at me. Th those numbers. Oh no, sir! If those, I'm screaming at you, you'll know it. This yeah. is not screaming, gentlemen. Th th those numbers were impacted partially by the Boeing impact. Those numbers were partially impacted by the strikes. At, 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 at and I would say they've also been impacted by a significant slowdown in global growth. And I think you're going to see growth uh, quite significant uh, in the pickup in the rest of the year and, and next year. So there's no question American taxpayers are seeing the benefit of tax cuts. Thank you, sir. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Uh, first, I want to thank you for directing Treasury to put America first and standing strong for American interests during the recent uh, international insurance negotiations. Um, I, I, and I think you agree, must be very cautious about imposing European capital standards on U.S. insurers. So I'm glad Treasury has registered its official opposition, so I want to thank you for that. <clears throat> My first question, I'd like to talk to you about the National Association of Registered Agents and Brokers, NARAB. Um, in the five years that we've had NARAB, it has never been operational because the board of directors must be nominated uh, by the president and confirmed by the Senate, and this hasn't been done. And the last time you were here, uh, we discussed that, and you committed that you would speak to the president uh, about how important it was to get these nominations done, and I just wanted to follow up and find out where are we on that process. 
we, we've put in recommendations and it's going through the process and we'll follow up with you again as we've suggested. Okay, and I appreciate that if you could stay on top of it because it's, uh, it's very timely and I'm concerned with uh, uh, timeliness right now of the Senate because if we proceed with uh, impeachment as it appears we're doing, we're about to shut down the Senate for potentially two, maybe uh, two months or longer uh, and not being able to get anything else done. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm also a uh, ranking member of the committee's Artificial Intelligence Task Force, and earlier this year we had a hearing regarding customers' digital identity, and uh, the task force chairman and I recently sent a letter uh, to you asking to move forward with some of the recommendations of the 2018 FinTech report, and just wanted to find out what action Treasury has taken to uh, work with the private sector on solutions to digital identity issues. Well, I think as you pointed out, this is something that we identified early on. Uh, it is something we continue to work with the private sector. It, it's something I'm also very interested in because of the IRS and uh, from the government standpoint as well. So it's it's something we're, we look forward to continuing to work with you on. It's an important issue. Okay, I appreciate that. And if you could keep us up to date on progress that's made, that would be very helpful to us as well. Um, also, in 2017, FSOC formed the Digital Assets Working Group, um, which is going to explore issues surrounding blockchain technology. Um, I applaud you for doing that, but the one concern I have is that state banking regulators have not have been excluded from the working group. And Dodd-Frank specifies that non-voting members of FSOC, such as bank, uh, state banking regulators, must not be excluded from FSOC activities. So. I think it's important that we have our, our stakeholders in the state involved, and do you know why the state regulators have been excluded from the working group? I, I don't, but it's it's not intentionally. I don't remember whether we, you know, kind of whether they were excluded from the FSOC. I'd say right now it's not as important issue, but if the state regulators want to be part of it, we'll, we'll absolutely accommodate them. Okay, I appreciate it. Again, if you could keep us to, abreast of that. Um, and uh, I also want to uh, close out by thanking you for your part of this robust historic economy that we have. Um, I, I see that we could even add another $68 billion into this robust economy if we could move forward with uh, the USMCA, which I hope that very soon we can uh, put the American people first and get f move forward with that. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Secretary, thank you so much for coming before our committee again. As you know, I mean, residents in my community, we have the third poorest congressional district in the country, and the economic recession devastated my district, and we're still recovering, not only in Detroit, but even the Wayne County communities uh, throughout uh, my district. And one of the things that we did through Dodd-Frank, as you know, is created the Financial Stability and Oversight Council. Um, you know, that kind of oversight of, you know, shadow banks, uh, is going to be critical, you know, too, too big to fail kind of banks and so forth. Under your tenure so far, and, I, and again, I don't, I would love to hear your vision of what you think this uh, council is supposed to do because so far, under your tenure, Secretary, you dropped the appeal of the district court's decision in a MetLife lawsuit. Um, I think there is not one single, not one single non banking institution uh, uh, that is, um, you know, designated as too big to fail or what we call, um, I believe, as systematically important financial institutions. I mean, what is the direction that we're going in if we're not doing any oversight? I mean, Dodd-Frank, the whole purpose was so that we don't have another downturn economic recession that led to predatory practices by these big banks. Well, first, let me say I, I share your concern and your issues, uh, and we are doing a lot on oversight. So the committee is very focused. But you don't have anybody to regulate. Uh, again, the fact that there, companies not have one single institution, correct? Again, that's a that's a good thing. That's because the the companies. So you think MetLife significantly Prudential? None of those are too big to fail. Uh, that is correct. That, that is correct. In matter of fact, they're a lot better capitalized. And by the way, GE Capital was de-designated prior to us coming here. So part of the benefit of the designation was it encouraged all these companies to de-risk so they wouldn't be designated and, and they wouldn't be regulated by the Fed. So that they have proper regulators. I want to be clear. The, the committee's job is to bring all the regulators together to make sure that the primary regulators are regulating these entities. 
But by dismissing the case, I believe, in, in MetLife lawsuit, I mean, we don't have that much authority now that we've walked away by saying that they would fall under certain guidelines for oversight. Actually, that's not the case at all. We, we have the same authorities we always had. The, the only issue we've talked about is including a cost-benefit analysis, which we think was required by law. So I, I just want to be clear. I don't view, I view it's good news to the economy that we don't have anything designated. And if we were sitting here with lots of entities designated, that would be a, a major concern of ours. Yeah, um, Chairman, if I may, I would like to submit for the record strengthening our, um, the regulation and oversight of shadow banks to the record. Without objection. Um, last question, it might be out of whack, but this is important uh, for me to understand. Do you believe uh, in, in socialism for corporations? Do I believe in socialism, socialism for, corporations? for corporations? A lot of people no, talk do. about socialism. I, I, I want to know, do you I, believe? I, I do not believe in socialism mm -hmm. for corporations. Yeah, thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time. Gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Secretary, for, for being here. Um, as you may know, I've been working with your staff on, on some World Bank reform issues and, and just want to thank you for uh, your collaboration on that. Um, to me, uh, I think when I look at the World Bank, the number one issue uh, is ensuring that China graduates from the loan program. Uh, it's unconscionable to me that my taxpayers, uh, our taxpayers, should in any way, shape, or form be subsidizing uh, the Chinese growth model. Um, and uh, my understanding is today, at this very moment, or, or maybe it's already happened, um, that China's country partnership framework is, is going to get a vote uh, at the bank. Um, I couldn't access the document. Uh, that's not your fault. Um, it wasn't on the bank's website. Uh, but my understanding is it provides loans for $1 billion in perpetuity. Um, and assistance in advancing the Chinese growth model internationally, a growth model that has social credit scores and turns its own people and obviously what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, huge issue for me. So I guess my first question is, it, just at a basic level, do you agree with the graduation objective? Do you believe that China should be made to graduate at the World Bank? I do. Um, and then secondly, as a follow-up, what's the best way to ensure that occurs? Because um, Right now, it feels like we have our hands tied behind our back, despite the fact that we're the largest shareholder and have veto authority. Um, it still feels like we have no ability to affect this. So how, how can we do it? I, I don't think that's the case. I okay. think that, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is something that David Malpass worked on with the World Bank when he worked for me. He, he, this was his number one issue in reforms, now at the World Bank and leading the World Bank. He's worked with China. China, I actually understand, is cash flow positive this year, meaning there's more cash coming into the World Bank than cash going out. Uh, I believe they're going to be under a billion dollars this year, and he's working towards them. And by the way, in the China program, as I've said, our executive board member has objected to the program, and, and I think that gets read in, and ultimately that will be on the World Bank's website. Yeah, and I guess, uh, so he objected, but we, we do technically have veto power, right? Can you uh, explain how that would work so that... Uh, Just to be clear, yeah. we, don't, we don't have veto power over every single loan or okay. veto power over a specific statement. We have veto power over capital allocations and in other issues. But again, I, I have great confidence in David Malpass. He understands this issue. He's working with China on this issue. We all share the same objectives. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I appreciate it. I, I, um, I certainly appreciate the progress, right? But for, but for me, even a dollar uh, is, is too much for our taxpayers to be contributing um, to China. Uh, as you may know, I've, I've also recently introduced legislation uh, to support the policy that you just articulated uh, to transition China off bank lending. Um, I appreciate the staff's, your staff's feedback uh, and look forward to further collaboration. Another section of my bill deals with debt transparency with respect to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I see providing debt management assistance as a vital piece of our national strategy, with some of our partners and allies sharing the same concerns regarding China's lending practices. Uh, can you talk about the current strategy and efforts to provide debt management assistance at the World Bank and the IMF to borrowing countries of the Belt and Road Initiative, and what are we doing to get other partners and allies fully on board? Uh, we, we have a lot of support at this issue, both the, from the leadership of the World Bank and the leadership of the IMF. Uh, as well as the G7. Everybody supports 
debt transparency. Uh, it's very important that China play by these common rules, and we've had very direct discussions with them. Thank and you. as conditions of certain IMF programs, without me going to specifics, we've demanded complete transparency on exposure. Thank you. And I look forward to continuing to work with your staff on, on these issues. I think they're, they're critically important. Um, shifting uh, a bit to the Volcker rule, uh, I sent you and, and the other prudential regulators a letter this week about the importance of establishing a regulatory framework that promotes investment opportunities in startups and small businesses. Uh, I know the, Volkers, the Volcker regulations are considering revisions to the covered funds portion of the Volcker rule. Um, for me, uh, I, prior to this job, uh, I ran a Silicon Valley tech startup, very easy to acquire capital in that, in that industry, uh, in that section of, of the country, less so where, I, where I'm from in, in Northeast Ohio and where I represent. Um, can you talk about uh, your thoughts on, on this specific issue and how it would impact private capital flowing into communities outside of places like Silicon Valley? Um, I commented on this earlier, but we are working on the regulators, and I hope over the next three to six months we can address this. I, I do think it's something important, and it and, and will help small businesses, and in no way is going to impact systemic risk. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Secretary Mnuchin, for coming. Um, I introduced H.R. 5194, the Climate Change Financial Risk Act, with Senator Schatz, of course, introducing the companion bill in the Senate, um, to create a climate change risk subcommittee within FSOC and to report annually on systemic risks of climate change to, um, to the financial system. The reasons for that are, and I'm sure you know this, but just to reiterate for everyone here, 2016 to 2018, average economic losses from natural disasters were $150 billion. The Paris goal, I just returned from Madrid, the goal of the Paris Agreement is to stay under one and a half degrees of additional warming. We are not globally on that target right now. We're not even at two. We are right now, if we don't change directions, we're at four degrees of warming. Eight degrees of warming is within the zone of possibility. At eight degrees, Manhattan feels like uh, uh, Qatar, essentially. Um, it's really unpleasant. The, at four degrees of warming, the global losses could hit $23 trillion per year. There are already predicted to be 311,000 homes that will be regularly inundated by 2045, and millions by the end of the century. This dwarfs the financial crisis. And presumably, a lot of those homes will be subject to 30-year mortgages. So by any analysis, that is systemically disastrous. And I want to just follow up. You expressed doubt earlier in this hearing about whether bank stress testing was necessary to assess the impacts of the climate crisis. Have you consulted with any climate scientists in the course of coming to that conclusion? So again, let me just preface, I have expertise on a lot of issues. Climate is not one of them. No, no, I, I'm, that's why I'm asking who you consulted with. And, and I think there is a place and a role to study the climate issues and the impact on the economy. I don't think FSOC is that place. And, and, and I think there's plenty of other areas. Now, I will just so, say- So, so if, if I could, does the, does the Office of Critical Infrastructure believe that there is no systemic risk from the climate crisis? Because you're not an expert in cyber terrorism either, but presumably well, they actually, do look at Actually, I have become an expert in cyber terrorism. So I spent a lot of time on that because that is my primary responsibility. I, I, I don't mean to criticize your expertise, okay. but I'm saying there are systemic risks that the Office of Critical Infrastructure has concluded. So have they concluded that climate change is not a systemic risk? I, I don't believe they have concluded that it is a systemic risk. I don't know in the negative if they've concluded it the other way. And But let me just comment, you know, outside of the United States, there are some areas where climate issues are very, very, very significant. So, you know, I, I think the U.S. has made a lot of progress on this. No, we haven't. <laughs> we, we, we are not on a sustainable path, but let me just throw some numbers. Likely sea level rise. We, we already know if we went to zero CO2 tomorrow, we still got another two feet baked in. Realistically, we probably have meters measured in. So at the likely sea level rises of the best analyses, there are $900 billion of U.S. homes that are underwater by the end of the century. That's at current values, they'd be worth a lot less by the time they go underwater. Has FSOC analyzed how that would impact the financial system? Not, not to my understanding, it hasn't. Uh, okay. Um, the projected private investor losses globally, depending on the warming scenario, 
is somewhere between 4.2 and $13.8 trillion, depending on the scenario. Has FSOC estimated the effect on systemic financial stability from those losses? Again, as I've commented earlier, and you've obviously spent a lot of time on this, and I appreciate that, there, there is a place and role to analyze these. I, I think that the issue for FSOC is to make sure that banks have proper disclosure. But I, I don't believe this is a systemic risk that warrants FSOC review, but I'll discuss it with the okay. committee. You've brought well, it up. I'm happy to discuss it. Okay. Well, the, 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 the concern, the and you know, just as I think about these things, I, you know, I don't, obviously none of us are rooting for this. But if I am an insurer and I'm looking at these risks out in the future, at some point when those, you know, not right now when I've only got a one-year policy in front of me, but we start to get to the point where those policies are coming due, I'm going to start changing my risk profiles. I'm going to stop insuring certain sectors. Um, we've seen what the maps of the country look like and where you will not want to live and where we're going to have crop failures. And it is impossible for me to see a scenario where those don't become systemic risks. And, you know, I, just before I left for Paris, I watched plane trains and automobiles with my daughters. And uh, I'm reminded of that scene where they're driving down the wrong way and everybody says, you, you know, you're going the wrong way. You know? <laughs> they don't even know where we're going. We're going the wrong way. We know we're in the wrong lane. We know there's a couple trucks coming down the highway at us. And if, if you don't think that FSOC should do it, I guess I respectfully disagree, and that's why, that's why we introduced the bill, because I think we need to look into these risks so that we can swerve while we still have time. Thank Gentlemen's you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentlemen uh, from Tennessee, Mr. Rose is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Secretary Mnuchin. It's good to have you here today, and thank you for taking time to visit with us. One of the defining tenets of our insurance industry is that it is, by and large, state regulated. It is the strength of the country, and it is something we need to defend. Secretary Mnuchin, like so many of my colleagues here today, I want to thank you for your efforts to defend our state-based insurance regulatory regime, for your close and collaborative work with the state insurance commissioners, and for registering Treasury's official opposition to the ICS, or International Capital Standard, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I know there's still work to do on behalf of Team USA to ensure foreign bureaucrats don't dictate the rules for the uh, US, for U.S. insurance regulation. So I appreciate your continued efforts on the ICS and hope you will continue to engage with members of Congress and the state insurance commissioners as we move forward. Secretary Mnuchin, since the ICS was adopted, what are some of your main concerns with the current framework? Well, let me say I'm, I'm pleased to hear that there is bipartisan support on this issue. We do very much support the state regulatory mechanism for insurers. And, and we, we are concerned, and we've expressed these concerns, that some of the, although they're not required to be adopted, that it could force the industry in a way that is detrimental to our, our leadership and our state-based regulators. Thank you. Vice Chair Quarles uh, said in his January 2019 remarks at the American Council of Life Insurers that the Federal Reserve's building block approach, or BBA, could strike a better balance between entity level and enterprise-wide supervision of insurance firms, which would facilitate the continued robustness of product availability here in the United States. I believe part of the intent behind developing the BBA was that it could be uh, deemed comparable to the ICS. Uh, Mr. Secretary, are you familiar with the BBA? I'm not completely, but uh, I will follow up with your office. Uh, we have a lot of people who have experts, as you know, and have spent time on this, focused on it for me. Okay, thank you. Do you think that the BBA's, based on what you know now, the BBA's framework or the BBA framework could eventually be recognized as, out, as an outcome equivalent approach to the ICS, and would it be preferable in your opinion? Again, I want to get back that, to you on that, but, but, but I, I believe that's the case, but I want to get back to you because I'm right. on that issue. To reiterate, I believe it's important that we as members of Congress uh, also continue to voice, <clears throat> pardon me, our uh, bipartisan support for the state-based insurance system and so along those lines, I want to thank my colleagues, Mr. Heck and Mr. Budd, for introducing uh, the International Insurance Standards Act. Again, this Congress, which I was proud to co-sponsor. Secretary, uh, is there anything else that you're aware of that we as member of Congress should be doing to help uh, the USA's position on the ICS? 
I think not at the moment. You've been very supportive working with our office. We've had a lot of bipartisan support as uh, we went to, with Team USA to represent these issues. Thank you. Transitioning over to some other issues, uh, I wanted to ask you about the FSOC's work on the transition away from LIBOR as a reference rate. LIBOR is set to be phased out as a bank reference rate uh, by 2021. From, from the FSOC September minutes, I understand LIBOR is the underlying reference rate for approximately 200 trillion in financial contracts worldwide. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, I know this will likely cause a bit of disruption in our markets and that the alternative reference rate committee's preferred alternative to LIBOR is the secured overnight financing rate or SOFR. What makes the SOFR a suitable alternative? Well, I think the most, the most important issue is that we have a transition from all these loans and all these securities. The thing that we like about SOFR, and again, this, pre, this work predated me, is that it's a very liquid market, it can't be manipulated, and it's readily calculable. I, I met with a group of banks yesterday. There may also be, no different than there were LIBOR loans and there were prime loans, there may be a more of a credit-oriented index that develops as well. But this is, this is something we're, we're very focused on the transition. And I think you've, uh, in the remaining seconds here, as we transition from LIBOR to SOFR, what sort of outreach is Treasury doing to engage with stakeholders as attention to the LIBOR transition increases? We, we have a huge group working on, as I mentioned yesterday, myself, Chairman Powell and a bunch of the regulators met with 10 of the, the, the CEOs, and we continue to have outreach working on this. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Wexton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Mnuchin. It's nice to have you back with us today. Uh, in September, the House passed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, which is bipartisan legislation that was authored by Senator Rubio and co-sponsored co by 44 senators and 130 U.S. representatives, including many on this committee. This week, the House passed the Uyghur Intervention and Global Humanitarian Unified Response Act, or the Uyghur Act. Both these bills seek to hold officials in the Chinese government and Communist Party responsible for the gross violations of human rights in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, including the mass internment of over one million Uyghurs, as well as China's intimidation of U.S. citizens on American soil. The Uyghur Act passed uh, 407 to 1. Would you recommend to President Trump that he sign these, these bills when they come across his desk? Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to make any comments publicly about what my recommendation will be to the President one way or another, but that doesn't mean I'm not recommending it. Okay, because I'm, we're getting mixed signals from the White House officials, and reporting is suggesting that Treasury, uh, the Treasury Department, and you in particular, are responsible for blocking or slow walking <coughs> efforts to hold Chinese officials accountable. No, that's not accurate. Okay, well, there, I'm going to read from an article, an October 8, 2019, New York Times article, which I'd like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Uh, senior officials in the National Security Council and in the State Department have pushed for the use of the entity list to char target Chinese companies supplying surveillance technology to the security forces, forces in Xinjiang. They have also urged Mr. Trump to approve sanctions that would penalize China, Chinese officials and companies involved in the abuses. The top American trade negotiators, including Treasury Secretary St Stephen Mnuchin, have cautioned against policies that would upset, upset trade talks. Are you saying that that is inaccurate reporting? That is inaccurate reporting, and I think you know how we feel about the New York Times. But are you willing to sacrifice human rights abuses for the sake of trade talks? Because it certainly appears that way. Again, let me just say I'm, I'm here to talk about financial stability, but I will respond to your question. I very much am concerned about human rights issues all over the world. We administer Global Magnitsky, sanctions all over the world on sanctions. Uh, we've administered things in China as in other places, but I'm not going to make any comments on confidential discussions I have with the president on these or other subjects. So related to that, back in April, um, I joined a number of other um, members of Congress and uh, the Senate 
in a letter to address to you, uh, Secretary Pompeo and Secretary Ross, uh, urging the administration to impose global Magnitsky at sanctions on senior policy leaders who were complicit in these gross violations and human rights abuses, including Chen Guangzhou, who's the so-called architect of the roundup of Uyghurs. Um, and we never received a response from Treasury or from you, so while I have you here, uh, what is the status of global Magnitsky sanctions on Chen Guangzhou and other senior party leaders in China? I, I thought State had responded for that letter on behalf of all of us, uh, but we can... Uh, we'll get back to you. I thought State responded from all of us, but as a general comment, we don't, we don't make comments on future sanctions at all, although I will tell you, uh, whenever we get letters, we take these things seriously. Okay. And when, and that letter was sent in April, so it's more than six months ago, we've gotten no response and there's been no action by Treasury. Well, so. again, if the letter was written to all three of us, it's common that one agency responds if it's an interagency issue. It's not common that we all respond. Uh, again, I believe the State Department, did the State Department respond to you? Yes, but they did not respond on, on Treasury's behalf. Was well, it, it, again, the way we work on interagency issues is the primary agency that's responsible for an issue responds. Okay. And, and again, I won't and comment on future sanctions other than to say that article was inaccurate. And while we're, while we're discussing human rights viol violations, I want to follow up on a question I asked you last time you were here about six months ago. Uh, when is the administration going to hold Mohammed bin Salman accountable for ordering the brutal murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Again, I don't see what that has to do with financial stability, and you're also making certain assumptions, but I, I can tell you, because I was the official who went over after Secretary Pompeo, and again, we had very direct discussions uh, about our concerns on these issues. General Lady's time has expired. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, is recognized for five minutes. Well, good afternoon. I really appreciate you being here and appreciate your continued efforts at the Treasury Department to ensure that we get to those better outcomes we've always talked about for the American people, for the American economy, and for American competitiveness around the world. And I know in many of our dialogues and discussions, your passion for that very same topic. Uh, I did want to ask a little bit about um, some of the public debt market structure. I know you've had a lot of conversations about this. You've spoken publicly about it. But I wanted to better understand kind of where Treasury is with regard to disseminating data in the Treasury market, right? This is something that for every other asset class, for most other assets that are traded, you get both price and volume information after the fact, um, which has led to increased competitiveness, increased liquidity, and also lower transaction costs associated with that market. And I know Treasury has been looking into that for quite a while, and I think recently uh, said that they were going to start disseminating much after the fact volume data, but weren't going to put out pricing data or volume data that were very close to those trades. I was curious why that decision was made um, when FINRA keeps all of that data, and is there for, are there further steps that are going to be taken to release more data around transaction in the Treasury market? Long-winded well, question, sorry. No, no, let, let, let me respond. And, and, yeah, please. And look, th th this is a complicated issue. Right. Okay, so first let me just say, the U.S. Treasury market <clears throat> is one of the most liquid markets in the world. It has very small transaction costs, and obviously it facilitates our borrowing. So our number one objective right. is to make sure that we do anything that is not detrimental. I totally to understand market. that, and I so, stipulate to you that it is a well-functioning so, market. So we've, we've studied this carefully and trying to balance the, the disclosure issues and whether that really is going to help or hurt the market. I, I will say, as you look at some of these other markets, mm -hmm. okay, and you look at the data, there is less liquidity mm -hmm. in, in a lot of these other markets. Now, part of the reason why there's less liquidity, I'll acknowledge, also has right. to do with the Volcker rule and banks not in one to proprietary right. trade. You know, when you look at transaction costs, you have to look at transaction costs in the context of overall liquidity. And we're happy to come and talk to you about it, but we want to make sure we get this right. And uh, if there were, a, if it were simple, if it were clear to us that releasing all the data would create more liquidity and more transparency, we'd be doing it. Well, I certainly understand the do no harm philosophy, and I really appreciate that. And I stipulate to you, as you well articulated, that it seems to be a well-functioning market. There have been some 
blips along the way, October 2014 notably, right? Um, it's hard for me to imagine, and I hope you might expound upon, the potential harm from transparency in price and volume data. I understand that you want to do no harm, but it's also hard for me to understand what that harm might be. Could you help me understand a little bit about that? Again, I, th I think there are times when we've gone back and looked at the data mm -hmm. as it relates to other markets, Yeah. okay? There are times when releasing the data hurts liquidity. I, I'd also say another interrelated issue is the advent of electronic trading, mm -hmm. and a larger and larger portion of the government market is from people who virtually invest no capital, but mm -hmm. take advantage of sophisticated algorithms. Right. So again, I, I wanna make sure that the release of data, okay, you know, kind of, again, actually is helping the market and not just creating arbitrage opportunities for people who want to do electronic day trading. Totally agree. I just, I don't want to be pejorative to those that are taking advantage of those small arbitrage opportunities because they are helping to close the market, right, in a real and meaningful way. Um, and I don't want to us to make a decision because we want to prevent somebody from being able to take advantage of that in not providing the transparency that the market may benefit from. And I agree, it is well-functioning today. It is well-functioning many, many days. But I want to ensure that, tra that transparency is an important part of that market going forward, as do you. And I I'm certain that we share that passion. It's just sometimes hard for me to understand what harm might come on account of that. And I understand that you guys have looked at other markets and seen some adverse impacts to liquidity. But as you well know, it's really hard to hold everything constant when you're looking at different time periods, different markets, different asset classes. And so I respect the fact that you have a lot smarter people than I over Treasury to look into that. I want to. I will follow up with a question for the record, but I wanted to transition really quick and talk about the Taxpayer First Act that was signed into law in July. It included a provision that persons receiving return information must obtain the express permission of taxpayers. My question is really going to come down to the law stipulates that it's to become effective on December 28, 2019. I think there's been some guidance from the IRS that that, that is for all transcripts for everything that is sold after December 28th by Fannie and Freddie, and it may apply to those things that are before December 28th, and I want to get some clarity around that as quickly as possible because uh, it is important to the functioning of the mortgage time market. time has expired. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Axney, is uh, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Mnuchin, for being here again today. Uh, I know that we've heard a lot of criticism about the 2017 tax cuts as primarily benefiting the richest Americans. I absolutely think those are accurate, but that's not what I want to focus on. Uh, what I'm interested in looking at is how the IRS is treating uh, the wealthy. The Wall Street Journal reported that IRS audit rates for people making more than $10 million a year have dropped more than 80% in just the last four years. Why are the top 1%'s tax returns being looked at so much less frequently? Yeah, that's actually not the case, and uh, I'm, I'm working with the IRS to release the data because one of the issues is the way the IRS releases the data now is on closed cases, not open cases, but I can assure you, when I saw that article, I had the same concern, and I called up the commissioner and I said, we should be doing more of these audits, not less. So we are gonna release this data in a transparent way to assure you that the people who are making the most money are getting high audit rates. Well, that's fantastic to hear, so. Yeah, by the way, if you wanna give us more money for enforcement, I'm happy to take it. We will absolutely talk with you about that. I think that's a great idea. So you're, you're, are, are you telling me then you th the, lo the number is much lower that is, uh, that is being audited? No, no, it's higher, matter of fact, and th thank you. So uh, uh, I again, th this is the problem in the data you guys just gave me. The, the, the way we report the data is on, on closed audits, okay? And these audits take, obviously, a long period of time. Uh, I'm happy to come back and we will release, I'm gonna get the IRS to release publicly. The way I think we should be looking at the data is for each tax year, 
what percentage of an income group are we auditing, not what percentage has closed in that year. Okay, that would be great if you could uh, get that over to this committee or to my office. Uh, I would really appreciate that, uh, as well as if you could uh, make sure that it tells us how what percent is being uh, in currently being yeah, audited. Exactly. That's what, what people want to understand is not what percentage of the audits were closed in the year. People, what people should want to understand is in a tax year, what percentage of those people will be audited, whether it was closed in. 18, 19, 20, so sure. we'll, we'll get you the data. Yeah, yeah, no. That, I, I can assure you I had the same view when I saw it. L listen, I'm glad to hear that. My concern is I just want to make sure that those who are the wealthiest among us in this country are being audited at the same rate that other folks are, and from what we can see right now, which is the data that we're able to have access to, it shows that they're being audited at a much lower rate. So if you can provide us with information that differs from that, I would love to see that, so I appreciate that. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, back to the 2017 tax law included two provisions intended to limit the use of tax havens for multinational corporations, of course, guilty and beat. Uh, the IRS's own data shows that in 2016, U.S. corporations booked more than $33 billion of profits in Bermuda, despite having only 384 employees there. So for anyone trying to do that math, this is high productivity. That's more than $85 million per employee. My goodness. Uh, now, I know that data is from 2016, that's before the tax cuts were passed, but I'm using it because it's the last information that we have. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, my question is, has there been a significant reduction in profits booked in Bermuda in 2017 or 2018 data? I, I don't have that data. We're happy to look into it and get back to you, but I will tell you, part of the reason we moved from a global tax system to a territorial system with the guilty tax was to basically prevent people from moving to tax havens and make sure that the U.S. taxed companies fairly. Okay, great. Well, I'm so glad to hear that um, because from what we're seeing right now, what we've seen in the past, that's not happening. I'd love to see if we're making some improvement on that. Obviously, I want to make sure that we limit corporations' use of tax havens. We need all that money here in the United States so we can address things like infrastructure and things that people in this country need. I guess I'd ask you, what suggestions do you have for continuing to work on curbing the use of tax havens? Again, there were many regulations we put out through uh, the, the last two years on the Tax Act uh, that limit these types of things. And again, we're happy to follow up with you specifically on some of them. Okay. And then lastly, the European U Union has actually had success in reducing tax havens use, uh, simply by requiring public disclosure of country by country income. Is that something you think might help? Not, not necessarily, uh, although I will say, you know, a lot of the information exchange with the Europeans is helpful in looking at tax havens. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for coming in today. Um, I looked at through the minutes of the FSOC meetings this year, and I didn't see any mention of student loans. Um, the total outstanding student loan debt burden is now at over $1.5 trillion. Um, young people are waiting until their 30s and 40s to have children, buy a home, make other major purchases. So do you believe that student loan debt currently poses a major risk to our financial stability? Uh, I share your concern on student loans, although I don't think it is a major risk to financial stability. But I can assure you, on an interagency basis, we are working with the Department of Education and the NEC, because I think in many cases, uh, people have taken out student loans that have created certain issues mm -hmm. for them. So student, student loans are a large part of, of the debt, and that's something we're carefully studying. So, it's, so it is a problem, but not a major risk to financial stability. Um, so I just wanted to kind of run through a few different topics here. Uh, turning back to the minutes from the FSOC meetings, I also didn't see any mention of climate change. Do you believe climate change poses a risk to our economy? You, you may have missed my comments before oh, on this. And I, I, I acknowledge that climate change should be discussed in certain areas. FSOC is not an area where I believe it, it should be discussed. But based on previous discussions, I said I'd raise that with the committee. Okay. Um, let's talk about leverage lending. I know there was some discussion of it earlier, but uh, it is up 20% this year with a total outstanding, billion, uh, outstanding balance of over $1 trillion for the first time. 
I heard earlier you don't think it poses a threat to our financial system either. Is that correct? Not at this time. And specifically, it doesn't pose a threat to the banking system uh, or the insurance system. But this is an area that FSOC will continue to monitor on a quarterly basis because it is an area, particularly if the economy slows down, we want to carefully monitor. Do you see uh, similarities between collateralized loan obligations and mortgage-backed securities that helped trigger the 2008 financial crisis? Not, not at all. No. Um, we've talked about student debt. What about medical debt? We spent about $3.3 trillion on health care last year. That's more than $10,000 per person. That's up almost 20% over the last five years. Um, do you believe that medical debt poses a significant risk to our financial system? Again, I would say this is not an FSOC issue, but putting on my treasury hat, we are concerned about the rate of growth of, of medical expenses, and that is something we're trying to look at many different things, because that does pose economic issues, although not financial stability issues. Okay. What about housing? I see some mention in recent FSOC minutes about mortgage origination from non-bank lenders. So I'm assuming you at least agree that there are some problems in the housing market that can pose threats to the stability of the financial system in that respect? Yes, I, I commented on earlier, uh, we are monitoring the amount of the mortgage market that's moved out of the banking system. Particularly, we're focused on non-bank servicers that don't have liquidity. And uh, we hope to work with this committee and others on housing reform. It's a, an important issue. Um, what percentage of mortgages were originated by non-banks this year? I, I think it's roughly 50%. It's 50%. A, it's so half of mortgages in America are being originated by non-banks. That puts them outside of the usual scope of regulation. Is that correct? No, not, not, not outside the usual scope of, of regulation at all. It's, it's outside of the banks. So it is something that we're looking at carefully. And again, a lot of those loans are sold to Fannie and Freddie or insured by FHA. So mm -hmm. we're also looking at it with, through all those different regulators. Mm -hmm. And what about the overall shortage in the housing stock? The number of homes for sale is about 6% nationwide. And it's down more than 15% in several large metropolitan areas. Um, does the fact that this market seems to be slowing down, uh, does that pose risk to the financial system? Again, not risk to the financial system, but affordable housing is something we're concerned about and making sure that there's greater access to affordable housing. Not an FSOC issue, but a Treasury issue. Okay, so we've got here student loan debt does not, risk, does not pose a risk to financial stability. Climate change potentially. Um, leverage lending does not, a, a medical debt does not, um, mortgage origination does not. What are some of the largest risks to our economy right now? Well, again, there's a large risk. And the risk financial to, system. Financial yes. system. So, again, I, I, I would, uh, you know, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to read the report, but, uh, again, if you just look at and we highlight cybersecurity, structural issues, alternative reference rates, uh, risk to the credit expansion. We specifically talk about non-bank mortgage origination, uh, financial innovation, housing, finance. Mm -hmm. And, and do, you, do you see that there's kind of a, a decoupling here with the quality of life um, from what we're seeing in terms of measurements of financial stability? No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making that connection, but I'm happy to explore that. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, Mr. Secretary, you're almost at the end of the line here. Uh, I was compelled to come back and take my five minutes. Uh, I wasn't originally, but I had to uh, ask you to elaborate a little bit more uh, on your dialogue with my friend, Mr. Heck from Washington, on capital expenditures and tax cuts. Uh, my views on this, uh, having spoken to many manufacturers and ag businesses uh, in central and eastern Kentucky, is that there's no doubt that the expensing provisions and bonus depreciation accelerated business investment, improved productivity, 
In fact, uh, most of the CEOs and small business owners said that tax cuts were huge in terms of pulling forward uh, investment that they needed to do to enhance the productivity of their businesses. Um, large and small businesses told me that, and it's made their employees more productive. And so my theory is when you look at Mr. Heck's chart of declining CapEx, it's not, it's, it certainly wasn't caused by tax cuts. Tax cuts may have pulled forward a lot of capital expenditures and business investment, but what most, uh, most uh, 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 private sector people tell me is that the decline in capital expenditures is not attributable to anything other than trade uncertainty. And, and also, they, they note, many of them, you know, we would continue to invest in a capital and equipment purchases and other uh, items that would make their businesses more uh, more efficient and more productive if the Democrats would stop opposing making uh, those provisions permanent in the tax code. Uh, the uncertainty of not having permanency with the bonus depreciation and uh, uh, expensing provisions is, is maybe an impediment for continued uh, CapEx. So I want your thoughts on th that feedback that I'm getting from actors in the private sector on CapEx. I also want your opinion about how trade uncertainty is contributing to a pause in additional business investment. So first of all, thank you for coming back. Um, there's no question from the companies that we see visiting all over the country that there have been major capital expenditures as a result of the Tax Cut Act. And as you said, uh, this incentivized companies because they get automatic expensing which I would just comment on when people ask about will the tax cuts pay for themselves, I remind them this has to be calculated over a 10-year period of time because this was designed to stimulate investment and, and lead to expensing in year one, which will recoup in year five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Um, as it relates to trade, I, I would say there's a lot of people who are waiting on the sidelines because of USMCA. Right. I'm hopeful that Congress will pass USMCA between now and the end of the year. It's the single most important economic trading relationship we have. And there's no question that passing it will add something mm -hmm. like 50 basis points to GDP and yep. will increase capital expenditure. Agree. And reclaiming my time, USMCA is is why we don't have the, that, that line continuing to grow uh, uh, up in terms of capital expenditures. So the best thing we can do in a bipartisan way in this Congress is to pass the USMCA. And I would argue that that's going to give you and uh, Ambassador Lighthizer momentum with China uh, and the EU if we can lock in USMCA. So I encourage my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to join us in supporting this renegotiated North American trade deal for all those reasons. Um, in my remaining time, I want to talk to you about leverage lending, lots of uh, hand-wringing on the other side, in particular about the growth in corporate debt. And I wanted to ask you your views on CLOs in particular as non-bank investor vehicles, taking some of this leverage out of banks, uh, federally insured depository institutions, uh, into uh, these CLO vehicles, um, and the extent to which CLOs as non-mark-to-market, um, long-term uh, uh, vehicles provide liquidity and could provide liquidity precisely in uh, the time where we need it in an economic downturn and to that extent uh, offer the financial system uh, a tool, a financial stability tool, and that if we overreacted to leverage lending, particularly um, if we overreacted to CLOs, that that could actually have a destabilizing effect and um, limit liquidity right when we need it. Well, I would agree with you, and I would even go one step further, which is a significant problem of the financial crisis was there was too much high-risk mortgages in the banking system. So the good news is the higher-risk leverage lending has moved out of the banking system into permanent capital vehicles. Thank you. Yield back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your appearance, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm on a mission of mercy. Here's why. In 2008, we had 215 minority banks. 2018, 149. 
Of the 149, 23 are said to be African-American banks, meaning 50%, more than 50% African-American ownership. And it seems, according to the ICBA, the Independent Community Bankers of America, this is dated October 22nd, 2019, these 23 African-American owned banks have assets of $5 billion, total assets, $5 billion. I'm on a mission of mercy because usually these banks are in neighborhoods wherein the people are not high income earners. They are underserved neighborhoods. They're economically distressed neighborhoods. And they are neighborhoods in need of banks, but these banks need additional capital. So when you mention your small bank mentorship program, it really made my heart warm. I really would like to know how this program will help me with my mission of mercy to help capitalize these small banks that I no longer call community banks. I call them neighborhood banks. Community banks, 10 billion. These neighborhood banks, if they can get to a billion, that would be a great celebration. Can you please share some intelligence on the topic? Well, I, I share your concern. I mean, it's, it's really terrible that these numbers have dropped as much as they have. And these are, as you said, to some communities that really, really need these banks. So the protege program is the step in the right direction of helping these banks, but we need to work with the regulators, we need to work with private capital in making sure that these banks have access to capital and can grow and we turn these numbers around the other direction. How far along are you with the program? My understanding is that you have a departure date that is certain in your mind, I'm not sure it's been published, but will this become uh, uh, viable before you leave? I wasn't planning on going anywhere anytime quickly, so yes. Okay, I've, I've heard rumors, I'm sorry, that you might be leaving. Le uh, leaving some, when? Some I've, I've said I'd stay for through the second term, so I don't through know. Through the second what, term? But my I don't apologies. know what rumors you've heard Listen, of me leaving. You're, you're talking to a guy who is proud to apologize. I apologize. I'm glad to know you'll be here. So the question becomes, how can we collaborate and work together in a positive way to affect positively these, these African-American banks. And I'm, I'm saying African-American because they're at the lower end of the totem pole. No other community, no other banks, when you take the aggregate, are in this kind of dire circumstance. So I, I really want to work to get some help well, I'm going to ask my staff to schedule a meeting uh, to get together with you. Maybe we can try to do it in the beginning of January and figure out how we can work together. I absolutely assure you that I will look forward to this meeting. And um, I would just add one additional thing about these banks. Um, I have many of them in my district. And um, they, they take pride in what they do. They have good personnel, but they don't have all of the technology that other institutions are blessed to have. And they don't have, obviously, the clientele, but there's a willingness to grow and to work with larger banks. This protege program, pairing smaller banks with larger banks, can reap some good benefits if it's done appropriately and properly. So I'm, I'm eager to hear more about how we can do this pairing and, and to work with some of these banks, these small African-American banks. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for being here, and uh, I, I appreciate the, the response, uh, your um, the response to, to my letter. 
in, in which uh, I uh, discussed the whole issue surrounding um, uh, the rise of white supremacy and, and uh, the El Paso attack and speci uh, specifically. Um, and I don't think there's much question that that, that attack was uh, motivated um, by white nationalism. Uh, and um, in my letter, I talked about the Treasury Department's ability or the tools you had available uh, to, to uh, challenge uh, uh, and, and hopefully even curb uh, the rise of uh, these style acts of white uh, terrorists, white nationalist terrorists. <clears throat> and so in your later letter, you, you, uh, you, you talked about the, the, the fact that you shared uh, my concern uh, over uh, the racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism. And... Um, and, uh, and, and then said you would use all the tools available. Uh, but uh, you also said that, you know, um, you, you did not want to comment on any investigation, which I understand and, and appreciate. Uh, what I would uh, like to know, however, is, um, well, based on, on, on what the FBI director said, which, which is, uh, and I quote, he said, a majority of the domestic terrorism cases in, uh, investigated are motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence. Um, and 40% of the 850 domestic attacks uh, were um, racially motivated. I'm one of the victims myself, as my congressional office was, was firebombed. Uh, but the gentleman was caught, and, and so that's, I'm, I'm not, I don't need any help there. But I do uh, know that, I mean, I want to, want to see where you are uh, in terms of trying to help curtail financing of these criminal networks. Now, I'm not asking you about what happened in El Paso. I'm asking you about, in general, the, the criminal networks that I think all of our, um, our uh, intelligence uh, counterintelligence uh, uh, units are, are saying is is out there, um, and is is there something going on in Treasury where those networks are being targeted? Well, let me just say uh, I, I didn't realize your office had been attacked. That's just a ho horrible situation, and uh, any of these attacks uh, are just despicable. Um, as it relates to Treasury's role. FinCEN plays a significant role in working with all of law enforcement. Uh, when I was a banker and I used to send in all these SARS, I always wonder if they went just into nowhere land. And I can tell you that uh, these activities and us being able to follow the money is very important in us being able to fight all these different activities. But it, um so is there a unit in Treasury that is actually uh, following the money? There is. So there's, there's two units. There's both FinCEN, which is... Yeah, I'm, yeah FinCEN, I'm familiar. And, and they're the ones who take in all the data, and they have huge analytic programs that work with all of law enforcement. And the other area is obviously uh, our TFI area, which is less domestically and more internationally, but to the extent there, there are domestic issues, we work with law enforcement as well. All right, Madam Chair, thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the Secretary for his time today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions to the Chair, which will be forwarded to the Secretary for his response. I ask the secretary to please respond as promptly as you're able. Okay, um, I'm going to interrupt the closing. We, we have a hard stop at one. If you'll take your seat, we think we can get you in in five minutes. Excuse me, Mr. Secretary, uh, for the inconvenience. Not Not but all. We're gonna try and get this done Absolutely. so that we can honor your hard stop. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Porter, is recognized for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I really appreciate your willingness to stay. Um, and I will be sure to be done in four minutes and 56 seconds. Um, in June 2017, Treasury issued a report on banking deregulation. Um, it suggested that um, if Congress raised the 50 billion threshold above which US banks are subject to stricter oversight, that Congress ought to do the same for foreign megabanks. Earlier this year, the Fed followed that Treasury recommendation and massively deregulated foreign megabanks, um, and that was an item on a wish list that you published in 2017. There's a lot that concerns me about this, but the most glaring for me is about Deutsche Bank. Um, I'm sure you're familiar, the chairwoman is very familiar with Deutsche Bank. Um, they would now only need to submit their living will once every six years. And this is the same Deutsche Bank that within the last six years had a surprise $3 billion quarterly loss. I don't know how you lose $3 billion and not see that coming. Has failed its stress test in three of the last four years. Was fined for a mirror trading scandal involving laundering money for Russian oligarchs. Admitted to participating in LIBOR interest rate market rigging scandals and violated US sanction laws against Iran, Libya, Syria, and the Sudan. Why, why are you advocating, why did you advocate to deregulate one of the worst corporate recidivists operating in the US banking system, particularly when it is not even a US bank? Well, let me just first say, uh, I share many of your concerns about Deutsche Bank. I obviously can't comment on any of the specifics because uh, from, from a regulatory standpoint, it would be inappropriate for me to comment specifically on Deutsche Bank. But I, I, I share many of your concerns, uh, and, and particularly the sanctions evasion is, is something that we will not tolerate by anybody, domestic or internationally. I think the issue, so I'm gonna answer this generically, not as it relates to, to Deutsche Bank. Uh, the question is, the banks will be regulated so the U.S. subsidiaries and the way that we've changed the structure, there's intermediary holding companies so that the foreign subs that are effectively U.S. institutions, we can look at the risk at that level. I, I understand, Mr. I understand the, the subsidiary foreign relationship. I, I just don't understand why when we would do something that is deregulating one of the worst actors uh, in the marketplace, it, and it, particularly when it's a foreign bank operating on our soil and threatening the stability of our markets. I understand there's a balance between regulating the industry and stifling capitalism, but if you do share my concern about Deutsche Bank, this gives us one less tool. Um, I wanna ask you about something else. How many people currently work at, the, at FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council? Hey, again, and there's been some comments on this earlier, so I, you weren't here, so I'll just clarify. The way FSOC works is there are people who directly work under FSOC, yeah. and there are people who work at all the different I'm agencies. I'm asking about the direct number. Well, the, 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 the direct number, okay, I mean, if you add up, there's hundreds of people, if you add up all the different agencies and how many people. No, I mean people work. whose sole job is to work at FSOC. Well, there's a, there's a small group within Treasury. Yeah, how okay? many? And then there's the Office of Financial Research, which we've cut significantly because we thought those resources weren't being used appropriately. Because financial research isn't valuable? Uh, again, we didn't think that was the best use of taxpayer money. So it was really a function of, we felt that the, the resources within the different agencies, which are quite ample, and quite significant that are dedicated to this. But, so I, I just wanna be clear, how many people work at FSOC and only at FSOC? Well, it, it, Is it again, a secret? Again, we probably have, when you say at FSOC, are you referring within the Treasury Department that are Let's only dedicated? Let's start there, since you're the Secretary of the Treasury. Let's okay. start there. Well, again, we probably have, you know, uh, about 10 people that are directly in the Treasury work on that, but we probably have 50 people within Treasury. Does anybody work just for FSOC? Yeah, there's a small number of How many, people. sir? Uh, again, it's it's roughly, it's, it's slightly less than a dozen people. Less than a dozen. Yeah. Do you know what the maximum number was at its height? I, again, comparing this to the middle of TARP, 
okay, in the middle of the financial area when, by the way, there weren't resources. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start over again. I'd like to thank the Secretary for his time today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions to the Chair, which will be forwarded to the Secretary for his response. I ask the Secretary to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the Chair for inclusion in the record. Thank you very much. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much.